Once again, it's announcement time and we have a lot to talk about, so I'm going to pass it over to Joelle right away. Thanks, Stu. If you are thinking about getting engaged or you're engaged, we have a seminar called Rules of Engagement just for you. You can go online to sign up. They will be meeting actually every Friday night in the month of April, starting April the 1st. There will be a light dinner at 630 and then the seminar will follow. And we just invite you and encourage you if you're thinking about this very important step in life to uh, join Rules of Engagement. Our next announcement is regarding a benefit concert to help support people in Ukraine. All of you are well aware of the conflict there and we're trying to do as much as we can to help our brothers and sisters, the people in Ukraine. So next week at 4 p.m. right in the, here in the sanctuary, the Loma Linda Academy, Music Department, the Loma Linda University Church Music Department, and UReach are partnering to do a benefit concert. It's going to be some great music, but it's going to support a wonderful cause. We encourage you to come out next week at 4 p.m. right here in the sanctuary. Also speaking of UReach, here's Linda Mendez, the director, to share more. Good morning, church family. I hope you're all having a wonderful Sabbath. This morning, I want to invite you to take a look at your church bulletin. In it, you will find a QR code like this one that will lead you to our UReach website. All you have to do is open your phone camera, point it to the QR code, and then click on the link and it will take you straight to our website where we will have a ministry update. We want to share all our ministries with you, the opportunities that there are to serve. We want to share ministry highlights, work opportunities, and other things that we have going on here at UReach. We currently have three positions opened at UReach. So if you're interested or want to find out more, or you just want to find out how you can serve, I encourage you to take the bulletin home and take a look at our QR code and visit our website. Or you can simply go to ureachlluc.com and you can find us that way as well. We want to serve with you and we want to work together to further his kingdom. Thank you and God bless you. On March the 26th, we are going to have the Meloshenko family here at six o'clock in the sanctuary. Many of you know them as a family who has been singing for over five decades. They've been with the Voice of Prophecy, the Quiet Hour, and they're going to be here in our sanctuary. Again, that's March the 26th at six o'clock, and it's a free concert. And this concert will benefit gospel outreach. Well, we've been announcing it for a couple of weeks now. It's finally here. It's this evening at 7 p.m. The Improv Program, that's a joint venture between the Redlands Adventist Church, Crosswalk, and the Loma Linda University Church. It starts at 7 p.m. and it's at the auditorium in Redlands Adventist Church. It's going to be a fun evening and we really encourage you to come check it out. Well, that's our announcements for today. As always, for more information, go to our website, LOUC.org, or our app. And if you are visiting with us and are a guest, we would really like to meet you. We have a great crew out at the Uconnect Center in the foyer. Come by, say hi, ask any questions that you might have. For the rest of you here in the sanctuary and joining us from home or wherever you're at, we love you guys and hope that you have a blessed Sabbath day.
want to welcome the Campania ringers to our sanctuary today to lead us in worship. And I want to welcome you, you who are sitting out here in the pews. We're glad you're here and worshiping together with us. And then wherever you are viewing and worshiping, we're glad you're here too and a part of our worship. At Loma Linda University Church, we are growing disciples in many different ways. And that's the focus of our church to grow disciples for Christ's kingdom. <clears throat> and we have many ways of doing this. If you look in the bulletin, you'll see several different ways that are mentioned. We have an early morning prayer line that meets at 7 a.m. every day of the week. And they started out to do it for 21 days. But that was nearly two years ago. On April 8th, they'll celebrate their second anniversary of this prayer line. And you can be a silent partner or you can pray on it. And then there's a, a women's prayer uh, time on Monday evenings. There's a Zoom Bible study and many different things that you can find on our website that you can partner with us on. And the bulletin can be found on lluc.org. The psalmist says, Shout, Oh, come, let us sing to the Lord. Shout joyfully to the rock of our salvation. And we are glad that you're here. Welcome to worship.
Amen. For all those who are able, I invite you to kneel for prayer. Our Father in heaven, we come unto you with grateful heart. Thank you for one more day of life. Thank you for health. Thank you for the blessing of being here worshiping you. Thank you for peace. And today we especially remember our brothers and sisters in Ukraine that are struggling. But we also remember all of those that are struggling because you know us, you see us, you know our battles. You know that by this side of eternity, we will have to fight the battle of faith to remain in your presence, to remember that you are Lord of history, that you're already a conqueror. You're already on that cross, won this battle. But help us, Lord, to really believe and live our lives with that in mind, in our hearts. Today, we welcome you. We acknowledge you as the Lord of Lords, as the King of Kings, as the only one that is worthy to be praised and worshiped. And we ask you, Lord, that your Holy Spirit will teach us the truth as it is in Jesus. In his precious name we pray, amen. brothers and sisters this morning. It is wonderful to be here in person, and we also love having you joining us. We're here for one reason, and it is to worship, to worship one. Now, we do many things while we worship. We sing, we pray, we commune, we listen to the spoken word, and we also give. Undergirding all that is a deep sense of gratitude. God calls us to give with a thankful heart. Now I think of this past week, and I think many of you may have truly wonderful reasons to give thanks to the Lord. I think of a family of a friend that had a baby to welcome this week, others that had birthdays. But you know, there's many that are suffering around the world and here in our community. So I think, how do we give thanks to God? Well, we look at the promises. We can all find reasons to be thankful to God this morning. When Jesus went back to the Father, he said, I will ask the Father to send the Holy Spirit. So we can be thankful and acknowledge the gift of the Holy Spirit in our midst here today. The Spirit not only reminds us who we are in Christ, he reminds us who God is to each of us. It comforts and leads and guides, but for me, the most important thing is he reminds me who I am in Christ. You, who you are in Christ. Also, we're thankful for this body of Christ, for the church. It provides us a community to worship together. And you know, it also gives us an opportunity to serve, to be his hands and feet. So this morning, I invite you to give with a sense of gratitude, to express your gratitude to God through your offerings. Thank you. 
More than two million Ukrainians have been forced to flee their homes and they are fleeing to the border to find refuge in neighboring countries. Elderly, people with disability, mothers with their children, all waiting for countless hours at the borders in hope that they will find food, warmth, refuge, safety. The following video that you will see will give us a glimpse of what our Ukrainian brothers and sisters are going through at the moment as they try to get to the border. The situation isn't getting easier. It will only get worse. As you can see, all these people are at the border, over two million of them trying to cross. The bombings have continued to happen, so we know the situation will only get worse, which means there will be more people forced to flee their homes. ADRA wants to be prepared so they can provide help to all these people. And this morning, I wanna encourage you to join me in supporting ADRA by giving. You can go to LLUC.org. There you will find the link to support ADRA. With this, they will be able to provide help for the people at the border, food, warmth, shelter. So I want to encourage you to give. 
I also want to remind you that next Sabbath, we will be having a benefit concert to support our brothers and sisters in Ukraine at 4 p.m. I hope that you can be here. And while financial support is important, prayer is important. It is crucial. They need our prayers. So this morning, I want to invite Pastor Anita Roberts back up so that she can say a prayer for the people of Ukraine, for their protection, for their blessing, but also for the countless individuals that are there trying to help. We ask, we want to ask her to pray for the situation. Thank you, Pastor Linda. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Oh Lord, words are insufficient to express Lord, our brokenness of heart as we watch the devastating pictures and images of people suffering, Lord, desperate to leave to a place of safety somehow, Lord. Lord, this morning here we worship in a comfortable place and in safety. And Lord, yet our hearts are broken for the people of Ukraine, Lord. We know your heart is broken too, Lord. And Father, we pray that somehow, Lord, you will bring relief. Lord, we, we pray for peace. Our sermon today will be about peace in the midst of such horrific situation, Lord. We pray for mercy. Lord, the pain and the suffering is more than they can bear. Lord, show us how we can help. As we see the images of people from Adra and other people that are helping, Lord, the refugees, the countries surrounding Ukraine, where we pray for those who are helping. We pray for those who are leaving, even from here, Lord, heading there to help, to bring some hope and some relief. Father, you are merciful. Your word says that you see and you have compassion. And so this morning, Lord, we pray in earnest for your mercy and your compassion, Lord, to come upon the people of Ukraine and somehow bring relief. Lord, we pray for each of us to be touched in a way that makes us not only people of prayer, intense prayer for Ukraine, but also people that are generous in our giving to help them, I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Happy Sabbath, boys and girls. It's good to see so many of you out here this morning. Now, I am dressed a little strangely to some of you. Who can tell me what I am dressed as? Which one of you boys and girls can tell me what I look like to you? Just go ahead and shout it out. I know it's in church and we don't usually yell in church, but it's okay. What do I look like to you? A judge, wow, I, thought, I heard different things this morning. Somebody said, is, is it graduation Sabbath already? <laughs> Not yet, but yes, a judge. Now judges wear these, wear these funny robes for some reason, and actually they've been wearing these robes for over 700 years. Maybe it helps them do their jobs, we don't know, but some jub, judges seem to not be able to judge unless they put on that robe. Well, these robes weren't always boring and black. When, when these robes first started being worn, they were three different colors. Some were green, some were violet, and some were crimson. So green and purple and red. Well, the green ones were used for winter, of course. The violet ones would be worn in the warmer weather or the summer. And the crimson ones were saved for very special occasions. Well, that wasn't good enough for judges, so a few hundred years later, they changed, and some started wearing more black robes, but not boring ones like mine. They would be fur-lined, so they would have a big fur collar. And then the crimson or violet robes, they would have some 
pink ruffles added to them. A lot more exciting than the robe I'm wearing. Well, judges also had other things that I have here in my fruit basket. They had these funny hammers. This one is, we call it a gavel, and you, and you can use it to, to bang on things, but it's not very good for hammering a nail. And they, they had some, something else they, they like to use, and I'll show it to you. It's here in my, my fruit basket. I know it looks like, a, like, like, like maybe a sheep, but here, let me, let me see if I can show you how it works. There you go. So some judges would even wear a powdered hot wig like this. Now when, when the United States started, there were a couple, a couple men. One was the name, had the name John. He really liked the wigs and the robes. And then there was another man named Tom, and he didn't like, well, he didn't like England. So Tom said, I don't think we should wear the, the robes or those wigs with our judges here in America. Well, John, who was a lawyer, said, we have, to, we have to make it look official because people have to do what the judges tell them to do. So they compromised and they, they got rid of the wigs. But they, they kept the robe. Now, a number of years later, they, they got rid of the different colored robes and they became only black robes like the one I have. And so judges, even to this day, still wear these robes, even though there is no rule that requires judges to wear the robe. They could just show up in whatever they wanted, but people are expecting the judges to wear these robes. Now, what do judges do, boys and girls? Why, why do they put on this robe and do something? Well, the judge is usually there because people have some kind of argument or some sort of dispute. And so the judge's job is to somehow restore peace, to somehow get the parties to say, those two different sides, to say, here is what we're going to do and here is our peace. Well, I have a secret for you. The judge can order things to happen. In fact, the judge can say, I order that you are going to live in peace. Can you imagine, boys and girls, if you're really angry and your mom or your dad says to you, stop being angry because I told you to? What happens? Do you automatically just stop being angry because somebody told you to? That's really hard to do. But that's sometimes what judges do. They just say, you have to do this. But I will tell you, when I was reading my Bible, I read something that was kind of interesting. When Jesus was about to leave here, he left a gift for people. In fact, he says in John 14, he says, peace, I leave with you. My peace, he says, I give to you. Not the kind of peace that everyone else has, but the mysterious peace that passes understanding Jesus gives to us. We all have that gift of peace. Our fruit of the Spirit that we're talking about is that peace of Jesus, not a peace that a judge orders you to have, a peace that is gifted to us. In my fruit basket, I have the apples and the oranges, but today's fruit is the pear. The pear represents peace for us today, boys and girls. Whenever you think about a pear, it helps because it starts with a P, Whenever you think about a pear or you eat a piece of a pear, remember, Jesus gives us his peace. Happy Sabbath, church family worldwide. My good friend Margaret and I are honored to share scripture reading with you this, today. We will be reading from the book of Galatians, chapter 1, verses 1 to 5, and chapter 6, verses 14 to 18, 
uh, from the New International Version. Paul, an apostle, sent not from men nor by a man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead, and all the brothers and sisters with me to the churches in Galatia. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to rescue us from the present evil age, according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. May I never boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. Neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything. What counts is the new creation. Peace and mercy to all who follow this rule to the Israel of God. From now on, let no one cause me trouble, for I bear on my body the marks of Jesus. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit, brothers and sisters. Amen. Are you a person of peace? Galatians 5, verses 22 and 23 say, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Are you a person of peace? Somewhere I read about a seminar leader who asked the seminar attendees to participate in an exercise, an exercise I'm going to ask you to participate in. So I'm going to ask you to close your eyes, if you would humor me for a few, moments, a few seconds here. Close your eyes. And in your mind, I want you to picture a scene of peace, a place of peace. Where would that be for you? Now, I hope you're thinking about it because I'm going to ask some of you where that place is. Fair enough, you have it in mind? All right, David, I'm coming over here to you to ask you, what scene do you picture when you hear the word peace? Being with God. Very good. What about here in this world? Tell me, what do you picture when you think of peace? A uh, lake in Alaska. A lake in Alaska. Boy, we're going there together. Very good. Uh, someone, what do you picture when you picture peace? The beach, sea. The beach. Beautiful. When you think of peace, ¿en qué piensas? <laughs> Uh, two things, um, Del Mar Beach with my daughters and my childhood in the, my father's ranch. Ah, very good. Now the interesting thing is that not all of you, but most of you said something similar to what the seminar leader found that the people in his group said. When he said, picture a place of peace, the answers that he heard were, I picture the beach, the gentle waves caressing the white sand, I picture the desert. The saguaro cactus standing as silent sentinels to the lazy hawk riding the thermals. I picture the mountains, the tall trees, and the gentle breeze. What he noticed, which was largely true here today, was that in every scene of peace, as different as they were, there was one common reality. There were no people. First thing people did when they thought of peace is they got rid of all the other people. Okay, I got to get them out of here. 
If I'm going to think about peace, I don't want people there. And we can understand that, can't we? I did the exact same thing. Because people are a problem to peace. Switch on the news and you see the bombs, the Russian bombs, blowing up buildings and people in the Ukraine. You walk into the office and you see that colleague down the hallway that causes so much conflict. You answer your phone and somehow this time the telemarketer got through and you spew a few choice words at them. And you think, I can't deal with all these people. And then you come to church and you get the question pushed into your consciousness, are you a person of peace? And you say, peace? Get rid of all these people. Give me the mountain. Give me the desert. Give me the beach. Give me peace. There I could do it. But the problem is that Paul, when he writes there in Galatians, he's writing in the context of relationships. The Spirit says the fruit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Are you a person of peace? It's an important question for us to wrestle with. After all, the one that we claim to follow, the leader of our faith, is one called the Prince of Peace. And the truth is, if you look at his life, you realize that there are echoes of peace all through his life. When he was born, the angel chorus sang, Glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace to those on whom his favor rests. When he delivered his inaugural address, which we would come to know as the Sermon on the Mount, he said, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called the children of God. When he came down to the end of his life, huddled with the disciples in that upper room, he said, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Then he would say, before the discourse ended that night, in the world you will have trouble, but in me you will have peace. And then once he had broken the tomb that he borrowed, when he appears to the gathered disciples for the first time in the Gospel of Luke, the first words out of his mouth are, peace be with you. The echoes of peace are everywhere in the life and ministry of the Prince of Peace. Now, interestingly, the word that is used for peace, the Greek word, is the Greek word irene. Of the different sources I consulted, I, I think the best one was William Barclay. His comment on what he has to say about peace. This is what he says. Usually in the New Testament, irene stands for the Hebrew shalom and means not just freedom from trouble, but everything that makes for a person's highest good. Here, in Galatians 5, it means tr that tranquility of heart which derives from the all-pervading consciousness that our times are in the hands of God. Peace. Barclay joins together the Hebrew shalom and the Greek irene for good reason. They do have many similarities. In fact, when it came time to translate the Hebrew Scriptures into Greek, into what we would later come to know as the Septuagint, the translators 250 times translated shalom with irene in Greek. Shalom is that comprehensive word that means wholeness and wellness and goodness and harmony, absence of conflict, peace. And when Paul comes to writing the fruit of the Spirit, he says, love, joy, peace, irene, shalom. And it's for that reason this morning that I ask you, are you a person of peace? I suppose if we're going to answer that question with thoughtfulness, we would have to look at three arenas of our lives. We would have to look at the big picture, our life in the world. We would have to look at the smaller picture, our life in relationships. And then we would have to look at the smallest picture, the life of our soul. So let me ask you, are you a person of peace? What about the big picture, the world? It doesn't take somebody who's graduated from kindergarten to realize that the world is riven by rage and shredded by conflict. 
This last week, as we looked at the images coming out of the Ukraine, we were reminded yet again of how damaging, how deadly, how diabolical war can be. That's the big picture. Our hearts break as we look at those who are experiencing profound fear and loss, running for their lives with no legitimate escape. Will and Ariel Durant, the married couple who penned the 11 volume series telling the history of the world, said at their time of writing that in their estimation, as they looked from their point backward for 3,421 years, in their estimation, there were a total of a scattered, not contiguous, but scattered 268 years of peace. Out of 3,421, under 8% in their estimation. No wonder somebody described peace by saying peace is that quiet moment when everybody stands around reloading. That's peace. I want to give you just a bit of a window into what war looks like for the people of the planet. Now this is going to be a quick hit. We're going to move quickly. The sources are two. One, the New York Times, a piece written about war some years ago. Second, the Business Insider. Some statistics from there. But listen to this. How much does war cost? For examples, Vietnam, 500 billion. Korea, 336 billion. World War II, almost 3 trillion. Iraq, 2 trillion. What can war cost each person in the United States? Vietnam, 2,204. Korea, 2,266. World War II, 20,388. Iraq, 8,000. How dangerous is war for civilians? Between 1900 and 1990, 43 million soldiers died in wars. During the same period, 62 million civilians were killed. In the wars of the 1990s alone, civilian deaths constituted between 75 and 90% of all war deaths. What's the civilian experience in war? They're shot, bombed, raped, starved, and driven from their homes. During World War II, 135,000 civilians died in two days in the firebombing of Dresden. A week later in Forzheim, Germany, 17,800 people were killed in 22 minutes. In Russia, after the three-year battle of Leningrad, only 600,000 civilians remained in a city that had held a population of 2.5 million. One million were evacuated, 100,000 were conscripted into the Red Army, and 800,000 died. How does war affect children? More than 2 million children were killed in wars during the 1990s. Three times that number were disabled or seriously injured. How many genocides have occurred since World War I? Dozens. The most devastating include those in the Soviet Union where approximately 20 million were killed during Stalin's reign of terror. Nazi Germany, where six million Jews were killed in concentration camps, along with five million or more gypsies, Jehovah's Witnesses, and other enemies of the German state. Cambodia, where 1.7 million of the country's seven million people were killed as a result of the actions of the Khmer Rouge. And Rwanda, where more than one million Tutsis and moderate Hutus were slaughtered over 10 weeks in 1994. It is absolutely mind-numbing. And in thinking about that, we get a bit of a window into why Joseph Stalin is reputed to have said, one death is a tragedy, a million deaths are a statistic, just numbers on a page. It drove someone else to say, we have all kinds of peace memorials in Washington, D.C., because we build one after every war. The picture is overwhelming. It's not just Ukraine as tragic as that is. In the midst of it, we sit in church asking ourselves the question, are we people of peace? I was looking this week getting ready for today, just looking, wondering what people do. And I ran across 
a group, a movement actually, that caught my attention. It's a group with a website. The group is called A Year Without War. A group of people across the age spectrum, including a lot of young adults, who made a commitment to that. I want to read you just the statement on their homepage. It says this, We are nonpartisan and nonreligious. We are neither anti-military nor a peace movement. We are a dedicated and engaged community of activists with a simple, clear mission to stop war for one whole year. We know that conflict between humans is inevitable. However, we know that war is an outdated and extremely violent means of conflict resolution, costing countless lives and resources. Living in peace is not simply the absence of war. However, the absence of war is the first essential step to living in peace. A year without war is humanity's first step to abolishing war. Our social experiment puts to use social media to give a stronger voice to a growing global community of ordinary people that just say no to war for one year. That was their commitment. Writing, talking, speaking, using social media to say, stop. Can we just stop the madness? I'm not endorsing the group. I did not have enough time to follow all the trails and find out all the realities for which they stand. But I decided to point it out for two reasons. First reason was this. They saw something and they said, we're people of peace. We cannot just sit by and watch this happen and do nothing. And yet we don't have the power. We don't have the ability that those in government have. But we can do something. They saw something and they acted. And they had a clear goal. Let's stop it for just a year. It failed. Their year was 2021. It, 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 maybe it fails to account for the true decadence of the human heart. But it did leave me thinking of this. For those of us who worship together, those of us who recognize that our power to affect the global picture is limited, severely at times, it nevertheless did leave me asking this. For those who follow someone called the Prince of Peace, do you think we ought to say something? Can we just idly watch? And so my question, are you a person of peace? That's the big picture. What about the smaller picture? What about our relationships? Not just our world, but our relationships. Our relationships with the people who sit around this sanctuary, our relationships with the people with whom we work, go to school, live in a community, our relationships. Story is told of an older couple living in a nursing home who fought all the time, couldn't stop fighting. They'd get so angry, they'd be screaming and yelling at each other from morning till evening. And finally the staff said, look, you can't do this here anymore. If you don't stop, we're going we're to throw you out. You've got to stop. And they just couldn't seem to. Finally, one day, the wife said to her husband, she said, Joe, that's enough of this. I think we need to pray that one of us dies. <laughs> and then after the funeral, I'll go live with my sister. <laughs> I read that, and I couldn't stop laughing. And I thought, you know, that takes me right back to the seminar. Get rid of the people, and we'll be fine. Give me the mountain. Give me the beach. Give me the desert without her. And him, then I'll have peace. Remember the Peanuts cartoon strip? One day Lucy says to Charlie Brown, I hate everything. I hate everybody. I hate the whole world. And Charlie says, I thought you said you had inner peace. She says, I do. I just happen to also have outer obnoxiousness. <laughs> I wish it were that simple, just obnoxiousness. But we all know that frayed relationships between people 
can be profoundly painful. There are a number of different ways we can go in talking about that. A number of different realities we could consider. Passages in Scripture on which we could focus. After quite a bit of time this week in pondering, I decided to read you something. This is not done glibly. It's graphic and it's disturbing. The reasons I chose to read it are twofold. One, because it's a reality for many among us. And two, because it's one of those things we tend to say only affects me, not my relationships with others. Well, you be the judge. It appeared a little journal called Citizen written by a man named Jeff Hooten. Hooten wrote, Forgive me, for I have killed. I have used swords and shotguns, handguns and grenades. I have shot, stabbed, and bludgeoned. I have crushed skulls with golf clubs and hammers and baseball bats. I have slaughtered men and women, drug dealers and crime bosses, soldiers and secret agents, mad scientists and aliens, zombies, and the pizza guy. I have killed hundreds, even thousands, so many that I lost count long ago. I have taken up machine guns, plasma rifles, chainsaws. I have learned to aim for the head. I've killed with Xbox and GameCube, PlayStation and PC. I've killed with joystick, mouse and keyboard. I've killed for hours at a time on screens big and small, on laptops and high resolution monitors. I've killed in my basement in my living room at the local arcade at a neighbor's house with a co-worker's teenage son. I've killed late into the night until three or four in the morning because my adrenaline was surging, because my kids were safely in bed, because I was simply on a roll, because I was winning and they were dying. Every weeknight I play most nights later than the one before. And every night I slink upstairs and ease my weary frame into bed, trying not to disturb my wife who went to sleep hours before. My body is spent, yet I cannot sleep. The bedroom is silent, yet I can still hear those ominous refrains. I close my eyes, yet I can still picture the endless corridors, each one leading to net yet another door or outcropping, another blind corner, another enemy, another target. Come Saturday morning, I'm at the computer again. That's when I hear it. The muted thud of feet on the stairs. And there, standing to my right, Eyes fixed on the screen is my little boy. I tell him to go back upstairs, but he doesn't budge. In his mind, there's a cartoon on the computer, the likes of which he's never seen before. He somehow knows that this is forbidden fruit, that he must possess its secrets or at least observe them. I call for my wife, asking her to please come and get her son. Later on, this boy, who has never operated a joystick in his life, asked me a question that I never saw coming. Daddy, can I watch you play the bad game? It's just a game. They aren't real, just images. But psychologists commenting on such say, it's a combination of the two worst realities, surging adrenaline and turning off moral thoughts. It's just a game. Are you a person of peace? The Apostle Paul, who penned this list of the fruit of the Spirit, would over in Ephesians, describing the life and ministry of Jesus, to bring Jew and Gentile together, in other words, to bring reconciliation, to create peace, would write, 
he came and preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near. His purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two by which he put to death their hostility and created peace. That's the second picture, the smaller picture, our relationships. You can't read very far in this book, certainly not in the New Testament of this book, without realizing that the measure of our relationship with God is our relationship with others. Are you a person of peace? The third picture, the smallest picture, your soul. Not just your world, not just your relationships, but your soul. Are you a person at peace? I asked a group, a Bible study group one time, tell me what you think of, what thoughts come to your mind when you hear the word peace. One person said, for me, it's long hairs and hippies flashing peace signs. I thought, okay, you've been around the block a few times. Um, Another person said, it's nirvana. I said, wow, really? Okay. Another person said, it's harmony between people. I said, okay. And then another person said, peace is a little pill called Paxil. I said, okay. It sometimes is. And used correctly can be a godsend. But... Is there something else that we could find that speaks to peace in our souls? I've noticed over the years that one of the most read and quoted and prayed over texts, one of the favorite passages in all of Scripture, when it comes to questions like that, was also penned by Paul. You know, Paul did all right as an author, in case you hadn't noticed. Paul in Philippians, Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 and 7. How many times have you read these words? How many times have you prayed over these words, especially when you've been facing difficult situations and circumstances? Philippians 4, 6, and 7. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. If you take some time with this text, I think you'll see that Paul is saying in the first part of the text three things. He's calling on us to make choices about our attitudes. He's saying, be glad, be gracious, be grateful. That's the early part of the text. Be glad, be gracious, be grateful. Make choices about the attitude you have in your life. But then in the latter part of the text, he he uses a little phrase that's a little bit difficult to wrap our minds about, the peace of God which transcends all human understanding. What does he mean by that? I'll tell you what I think Paul is saying. But first, notice what he's not saying. He does not say God will change your circumstances. God will bring peace to the world. God will bring peace to your work situation. God, he, he doesn't say God's going to make everything good. Kiss it and make it better. He doesn't say that. But what he does say is this statement about the peace that transcends all human understanding. You know what I think Paul is saying? Paul is saying, be glad, be gracious, be grateful. And no one will be able to explain your peace. No one will be able to explain it. It makes no sense. Have you seen John? Have you seen Mary? Life is caving in on them. But they're at peace. Makes no sense. You've got to well, wake up and smell the smog. I don't think you know what's going on in your life. Otherwise, you wouldn't be at peace. And that's what Paul says. In the presence of God, with Jesus' love in our hearts, with the Holy Spirit living in our lives, be glad, be gracious, be grateful, and no one will be able to explain your peace. It will make no sense. 
That's the reality toward which He calls us in our souls. That's the smallest picture. The picture that is based on the promise that God is for us, not against us, not angry with us, but wants to draw us to himself and have a forever friendship together. That's peace. So I ask you, are you a person of peace? Once upon a time, in a land far away, a king sponsored a contest. Word went out from the palace to all the artists in the land. If you can paint the painting which the king deems to be the best expression of peace, you will be wealthy. So every artist, every wannabe artist in the land grabbed a palette, grabbed a brush, gra brush, grabbed a canvas, and began to splash paint onto the canvas in hopes of riches. The day came when they were all displayed, and the king slowly made his way through the art display, looking at every painting, pausing over some, but finally lingering over two. The first was the painting, the most serene painting, people said, of the entire art display. Crystal waters of a lake, reflecting the puffy clouds of the sky, the mountains in the distance, their snow-capped peaks. One just sensed peace descending in looking at the painting. The king lingered there. But then there was the second painting. Truly a masterpiece also showed mountains, sky. But in this case, it was a turbulent scene of turmoil. The trees were bending under the weight of the whistling wind. You could almost hear it as you looked at the painting. The cascading water surging over the falls. Cast spray high into the air, the dark skies, the clouds, the lightning. One could almost feel the thunder. It was a painting filled with turmoil. But there, just to the side of the waterfall, was a bush clinging tenaciously to the cliff. Lodged in the branches of the bush was a nest and a soon-to-be mama bird sitting quietly on her eggs. And the king's eyes were drawn to that bird and he had his winner. Are you a person of peace? In Galatians 5, Paul says, if the Holy Spirit resides in your life, the Spirit, regardless of your circumstances, will inexorably, unflinchingly, unfailingly grow you into a person of peace. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace. Gracious God, we're in a ruptured world. The fracture is evident on every hand. Let us be thoughtful in whatever way we can be to be agents of your peace. And might your Holy Spirit so fill us, so change us, that the fruit of peace will continue to mature in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen.
Time now for Week in Review, and uh, before we get started, uh, here's Dr. Taylor uh, with this week's live Sabbath sponsors, Dr. Taylor. And we have Miss Esther and her family supporting the LLVN, the Wilson family from Maine, and then they go down into Maryland, the Lawrence family, and we cannot beat the folks in Colorado, the Wiggum family, supporting the live Sabbath broadcast. Wow, this is really, really a great thing, right? Oh, it's more than great. We yeah. just appreciate it here. Well, uh, you're a great thing, and I thank you for joining us for this edition of Week in Review. We have a special guest, uh, Pastor Carl Hafter. We're going to be talking to you about uh, the big uh, Christian Connections replay in a few minutes. Uh, also uh, joining us is... Uh, Hi, Sheila. Hey, Marlon. <laughs> <laughs> Sheila Hodgkins, and, uh, and uh, everybody knows Gannon. So time now for the verse of the day. Um, I think it's in uh, the chapter of Mark in the New Testament. That's right. Mark 1, 15. And it reads, the time has come. He said, the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. Hmm. Is that uh, sage advice to follow? Definitely. The good mm -hmm. news, what it's all about. Where God has conquered, and therefore we are renewed. Mm. We can thank God for it. That's good news. Excellent. Yeah. What would you? Why, why did you choose that first to share with us today? Well, first of all, because it's it was the theme of this week about God's kingdom come, and uh, I learned something. Mm. You know, I was reminded that you know we want God's kingdom to come, just like Jesus's prayer. You know, the Lord's Prayer when he said, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Mm -hmm. Especially so, in these times. Absolutely. Yeah. And mm -hmm. it, was, it was a great conversation that people should watch on the replay. Mm. They won't want to miss it. Uh, what does this verse say to you, Pastor Carl Hafner? It says that um, no matter the chaos and craziness of the world, we can live in the presence of God. The kingdom of God is at hand in Christ, in his presence. Mm. Uh, the reality of the kingdom and, and God's kingdom comes breaking through uh, this dark world. So mm. it reminds me that there is peace and comfort and in the presence of God. Mm. Kenham has the last uh, word on the verse of the day. Kenham. Well, I mean, to Sheila's point, the her reading of the verse and, and, and everything I heard here, we have a choice to yeah. build God's kingdom here on earth or not. We are responsible for living in that kingdom here or be outside of the fence of that kingdom. So believers has to take control and decide, am I living God's way and according to his characters, or am I living according to the world? Yeah. And if we live according to his character, we have just built a healthy circle, uh, blessed by God and the Son and the Holy Spirit for us and for those who come around us. Well, this week's uh, Christian Connections, uh, where you can uh, see the replay uh, this afternoon, if you uh, missed it uh, this morning at 8 a.m., Pacific time. Uh, also, I think uh, through the weekend, you can uh, see uh, Pastor Carl as he delivers his message on uh, some uh, good news in, in, uh, in this bad times, the bad world. And uh, Tell us a little bit about, you know, the essence of what, what you're proposing. Yeah, it's uh, kind of juxtaposing the, the bad news that we are bombarded with uh, these days uh, with the message of Christ, which was consistent uh, in his teaching ministry. He just kept hammering on that same theme of the good news, you know, mm. the, the gospel. Uh, sometimes it's translated. And that good news is that now uh, the kingdom of God is accessible to all of us, uh, regardless of what's going on around yeah. us. Uh, we mm. can. Uh, live in the presence of Christ and experience a little bit of heaven on earth. Denim? Uh, I'm 
I'm just eating the words here. I just love everything I'm here, and I, um, everything is said here is true. For the believers, they will understand it. If the non-believers, they would wonder what we're talking about. But for believers, we do know living in the presence of the Lord here is all we need on this earth because He will provide, He will guide, He will protect, mm -hmm. and He will be with us. Now, as we know, heaven's never going to be on this earth until after the second resurrection and, right. and the m millennium. But I like the way that you put it because dwelling in his temple, our bodies are, are his temple, yeah. uh, is as close as we're going to get to heaven uh, on this wicked earth. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So but, thank you for your message, by the way, and making uh, the time in your busy schedule very welcome. to uh, help us out on, uh, with this on edition of Christian Connections. Now next week, uh, LLBN is going to be the topic on Christian Connections. Uh, Ganem is here to give you just a flavor of what that's going to be like. Ganem? Well, Christian Connections next week, we're going to revisit what God through His glory had done here in this ministry at LLBN. I told the group here during the break, we would be liars if we don't <laughs> testify that God, the mighty God of heaven, the creator of all things, had built this ministry from one block at a time to where we're at today and led to major growth. 70 million homes that we have reached to. That's a big number to reckon with. And part of that uh, is your help, your prayers, your financial support and giving, and the expertise that theologians bring here to LLBN on a regular basis basis. So next Tuesday, you don't want to miss it. There's going to be a group discussion, revisiting past, present. Oh, cool. We'll talk about the future also. Hmm. <laughs> that sounds really exciting. Yes, uh, yes. Maybe you better come back next week. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, another live program that we do here uh, besides uh, Christian Connections is uh, the Friday night worship live uh, with uh, Dan Smith and uh, Dr. Taylor has been involved in, in that ministry, that program, uh, since its inception. So tell us a little bit about it. Friday Night Live, you don't want to miss it. Yes, sir. Ruben Escalante, Dan Smith, plain practical preaching mm -hmm. that really, as they say, scratches us where we itch and helps us to live from day to day, mm -hmm. you see. You can't beat it. It's better than... The other one that follows it on Saturday night. <laughs> <laughs> Don't miss it. Uh, it's uh, live at 6 p.m. Pacific time. Uh, you can go to the website and check uh, all the information about it. And uh, also, if you want to just uh, binge watch Pastor Dan, well, you can do that too uh, with the VOD that's available on that website. Speaking of the website, uh, LLBN is constantly in need of cash, and this week is no different. Uh, there's a lot of ways that you can support this ministry, and here's Sheila with uh, one of them. One of them is the Charitable Remainder Unit Trust, um, the document for highly appreciated property. Many of our viewers have highly appreciated properties such as stock, securities, or real estate. The concern is, were they to sell these properties, they would have to pay capital gains. So taxes, and depending on what state you live in, it could be as much as 37%, and you don't want that. Enter the Charitable Remainder Trust. How it works, you transfer an appreciated asset into an irre irrevocable charitable trust, and you receive an immediate charitable income tax deduction. The trustee charity, LLBN, then sells the asset at full market value, paying no capital gains tax and reinvests the proceeds in income-producing assets for a term of years or the rest of your life. The trust pays you an income. After your lifetime, the remaining trust assets go to bless the Lord's work at LLBN, leaving a legacy of support. Thus, it is called a charitable remainder trust. I want to encourage anyone that has questions about this or other planned giving services to contact LLBN for more information. Hmm. And it's very, very important for folks to, to, to tap into these resources. We have Jay Hughes who oversees these projects, Marlon, but we have a, a, a group of attorneys, business people, finance organizations who are certified 
and set up just to do that for us. We don't do that here in LLB and we depend right. on our and the external entities <clears throat> that we have contracted with over the last 20 some mm. years. Professionals uh, at your service, uh, just call Jay. He'll tell you all about it and put you in touch. Now, Yanam is going to uh, give us a quick update because the time is flying, uh, but he has all the time he needs to uh, talk about the new building. Well, I want to leave time for everyone else, so I'll tell you. <laughs> you tune in next Tuesday to Christian Connections, and you can learn all about the building and how God being providing. But let me tell you, I am so excited. I am now seeing what I prayed to see 18 months ago. It is happening. It's right before our own eyes with pride and joy. I walked with Pastor Carl, yeah. and Dr. Taylor, and Sheila. Marlon, I think, was around behind us somewhere. But we walked in and we showed them the place and the big things yet to come out of this building. Glory to God. Glory yeah. to what he has done and what you have done to support this ministry. So thank you from the bottom of our hearts. Tuesday, you'll learn more about it. Yeah, don't miss it. It's uh, really going to be a uh, eye opener uh, on how this whole thing came together. And you know, Marlon, some people think it takes a hundred thousand dollar gift to help us be on business. You know, they have to give big gifts. The mm -hmm. truth is, the five and the ten dollars and the hundred dollars and the two hundreds and the two fifty and the thousands all adds up together to we're able to nurture this ministry 26 years on the air, 24 seven on satellite, on internet, on all different platforms and able to build a building over using the same operation funds that comes in to support LLB. Mm -hmm. If that isn't an act of God and an act of his faithful viewers, then I don't know what it is. Well, and, and I'm glad you mentioned that because it is true. We do not have any corporate uh, public or private sponsors at all, not one. Uh, we only have you. And as Gannon mentioned, your five and ten dollar donations uh, are what keeps this message going around the world. We've got nine foreign channels uh, that uh, support the thoughts and lifestyle of Jesus Christ. Uh, don't miss this opportunity to be a television miss missionary. Uh, call Jay Hughes and get the many ways that you can uh, support this ministry. Amen. Time now for your cards and letters, and Sheila's got a couple to share with you. Shirley from Raleigh, North Carolina wrote, I loved watching LLBN and making it a regular part of my day, telling people I meet about how to watch LLBN. May the Lord continue to bless you greatly. She's a witness, and she's a missionary. Mm-hmm. And William from Texa, Texarkana writes, Enclosed is a donation to say thank you for the beautiful music and spiritually nourishing programs you air. I'm blessed to have a part in LLBN's mission of lighting lives, blessing nations. Mm. Well, we want to thank Shirley and William. And Dr. Taylor, would you mind praying for Shirley and William? Shirley and Father, we thank you for the message. And we thank you for those who donate that this ministry might continue to belt the world. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Again, we want to thank uh, Pastor Carl Hafner for uh, joining us for this edition of Week in Review, and also Dr. Taylor, Sheila, and Ganim, and especially you. Uh, we wouldn't do this if you weren't watching. So we want to thank you for your support, and we wish the strongest Blessings from God upon your family for peace and safety and release from fear. That's what we're all about here at the Loma Linda Broadcasting Network. Time now for Week in Review, and uh, before we get started.
Happy Sabbath. I'm so happy that you've decided to spend your Sabbath study time with us as we continue our lesson on the book of Hebrews. Now, as we do every Sabbath, we're going to pray. But before we pray, we would just ask you to take a moment and consider the state of the world and maybe look at some of our partners, whether it be ADRA or another NGO that is attempting to help and aid people who are suffering in Ukraine. Also, if you're a local member of this congregation, we would invite you to consider donating to our UReach department and maybe even coming down to the concert that is going to be done in benefit of the Ukraine. For more information on that, please look at our website. And now, uh, let's go ahead and pray. Dear God, we want to thank you for your many blessings. We ask that as we think about our sisters and brothers in the Ukraine and our siblings across Russia, that you may provide us a way to be not only empathetic, but also, Lord, that you would stir, it, stir in our hearts a desire to be agents of the kingdom. So, Lord, whatever we can do, allow us to do it thoughtfully, responsibly with care and love. We also ask that you continue guiding our conversations as we reflect upon who you are and who you've called us to be. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. The landscapes of Bavaria began to flourish not only with seeds and grain, but also with monasteries and cloisters. And it was in one of these monasteries uh, that a woman by the name of Hildegard was given up as a gift to one of the abbeys. As she began to grow and understand who God had called her to be, she felt a deep stirring in her heart, not only to be a messenger of salvation to the rest of the people that were cloistered in the convent, but also to people outside of the walls of that religious order. And so she began to establish relationships with people around her, so much so that a noble family in the area brought to her a young charge. Her name was Ricardus, and Hildegard and, and Ricardus developed this relationship, this relationship was of closeness, almost uh, like a relationship between a mother and a daughter. But what I find more, most interesting about Hildegard's approach to monasticism and to religious life is the idea that one enjoys the experiences of faith with a community. Now, it's not just a community around one. Uh, whether that be a church or a family or, in her case, a monastic order. But it is a community that, sp that spans through the ages. And Hildeg Hildegard saw herself as an emissary, the latest in the line of envoys of grace and faith and compassion. And so her community was not only comprised of the sisters in the convent, it was also... Uh, made up of people like Basil or Gregory of Nyssa or even Macrina. And so I thought about how we link and how our communities link and how we are called to live faith amidst a cloud of witnesses. And I want to ask that you consider who is your community as you look around the people at your table or the people that are watching with you as you think about your local church community as you think about our Adventist pioneers, or as you reach down through time and think about the history of the church that links us to Christ and the apostles, recognize that you are the heir in a cloud of witnesses that continues to proclaim Jesus reigns. And it is in that modality, in that motif, that I'd like to invite you to open your Bibles as we continue talking about Jesus. If you have your Bible, we're going to go to the 12th chapter of the book of Hebrews, as we've been doing throughout this trimester. Now, 
You need to understand that Hebrews has followed so far a pattern. He begins always by exposition, and then he moves to, uh, towards exhortation. And you can begin to kind of tease out the flavor of what the book is about all the way when he begins to lay out the framework for the tale he's going to tell. And so I want to give us some context as we jump into Hebrews chapter 12. Think about what he writes in the second chapter right at the beginning, in the 10th verse, and help have that help you as an interpretive lens maybe as you consider the rest of the story. So Hebrews chapter 2 verse 10 reads, In bringing many sons and daughters to glory, it was fitting that God for whom and through whom everything exists should make the pioneer of their salvation perfect through what he suffered. And so at the very outset, you have this idea of Jesus being the pioneer of our faith. But the beauty in the book and in the exposition that the author of Hebrews leads us through is that Jesus isn't only the pioneer of our faith, he's also the perfecter of our faith. Now, how does he develop that notion? Well, if you continue going down the book, in Hebrews chapter 3, he'll begin to link the story of Jesus with the story of Israel in the wilderness. After all, there are two primary ways into, in which the history of the Jewish people is told. It is either told from the perspective of Exodus or from the perspective of exile. And as he begins to move from exposition, namely, Jesus is the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, and into exhortation, namely, don't be like the desert-dwelling Israelites that failed in their faith. That is... In a nutshell, the whole case that he begins to lay before us as we get into chapters 3 and 4. Now, we're going to leave that contextual reality behind, and we're going to move into chapter 10. Because after he begins to talk and to invite us not to have a failure of faith, as did the desert-dwelling Israelites, we recognize the magnificence of Jesus' sacrifice. And so chapter 10 begins to lead us through this notion. It is a notion that Christ is the ultimate enforcer of a new reality. Um, notice, notice what he says, for example, in verse 38, as he continues to exhort, my, but my righteous one will live by faith, and I take no pleasure in the one who shrinks back. And so he begins to establish this exhortation in which he calls us to be righteous in order to live by faith, to, as he would say, persevere. And that word perseverance is going to appear time and time again through chapter 10. Uh, the first time I at least saw it as I was carefully doing a word study of the original language begins in the section that starts with verse 19. And so this exhortation to perseverance takes on a really interesting linguistic agenda because Jesus uses this picture of perseverance in order to serve as an inspiration to the church. And so this great cloud of witnesses, this great, great community of which you and, and I are, an, are heirs to, is a community that is nourished by exhortation. Sure, we have this idea of exposition. We understand the reality of what the gospel is, but it isn't until we are exhorted to live life in a certain way that we can feel the nourishment and the connection with Jesus. Now, the word, like we were saying, that is used in chapter 10 for perseverance is a word that would have been used in the ancient Greco-Roman world to describe a sporting contest. And so it's almost this idea that is connected and woven through the whole epistle. Here's the exposition. 
Now's the exhortation. You're on a journey, a journey that is intended to produce righteousness so that you may replicate what Jesus did. Now, the Western church has always had issues attempting to describe what this process is. The Eastern church calls it theosis. In essence, it says, yes, Jesus has fixed and solved the sin problem. Now, for the Eastern church, the problem isn't really behavioral. It is a problem of a state in which you're in, shall we say. And so Jesus fixes that problem and then calls us and invites us to participate in a life of, as he says, theosis. The Adventist church picked up maybe just a little bit of that nuance because we say Jesus fixes the sin, the sin problem through justification and then invites us to live a life of sanctification. And in that sense, our understanding of how that interplay occurs is very similar to the Greek or Ethiopian or Coptic or any Orthodox church's understanding of theosis. Okay, enough for our context and for setting the table. Let's jump into the text. Therefore, Chapter 12, since we are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. And again, this idea appears, this notion of perseverance. So picture this, picture you are in in an athletic contest. But you're running a race or you're traversing a trail that has been tread upon by countless people before you. The wonderful linguistic thing, though, that the author of Hebrews does is he links the journey of the cloud of witnesses to our journey. Now, the linguistic composition that he chooses to use in order to describe this cloud of witnesses is by using two words that are really, really fascinating. This idea of cloud in the Greek is something that would have been obscure, something that isn't very clear, something kind of amorphous. And the notion for witnesses is this idea or this word that where we get our English word martyr from. And so kind of the... uh, A a translation of this particular opening line could be, therefore, since there is kind of this obscure group of people who have already traversed this trail that remains shrouded and have suffered, make sure that you run the race faithfully. Now, what is fascinating is that there's this feedback loop. There's a feedback loop between the cloud of witnesses that give you inspiration to continue running the race and your running of that same race, that same path that completes the experience for the witnesses. And so our faith is a shared faith. It is not only lived and breathed and experienced within the confines of Adventism. It is a faith that is bigger for it extends all the way to the centuries of Christian thought. So we're connected to this cloud of witnesses. And then he says, let us throw off everything that hinders. And the word here would be in an athletic context. You want to make sure that there are no weights that can impede efficiency. In the same way that when we race, uh, the people that are racing wear aerodynamic suits or uh, that a swimmer would shave all of the hair on his or her body in order to be faster. The author of Hebrews is saying, let us remove everything that would impede us from running the race efficiently. And I think The invitation then is to begin to take a personal inventory about the things that weigh you down, about the things that cause you to bend and to buckle on your path of sanctification. You see, for the author of Hebrews, the question 
is not what to do with the sin problem. For him, that question has already been answered in Jesus. For him, the question is, what do I do in response to that? How do I let my life and my spirit be formed and conformed to the life and the spirit of Jesus? And so he asks us to begin to do some inward work. We know who God is. We know what God has done for us. Now, how do we respond to that which Christ has done? And the answer to that is internal work. You know, too often we try to invite people to a destination that we don't know. We try to invite people to participate in a life-affirming and life-giving journey called Christendom when our lives are full of doubt and sadness and suffering and pain. And so the, the author of Hebrews is, is saying to us, let us take internal stock today. Let us do some internal work. I wish that we could take this as a primary framework in constructing our evangelistic approaches. Because what the author of Hebrews is saying is before you externalize the gospel, you must partake in some internal work. So here it comes again. Let us run with perseverance and the word he uses here for perseverance uh, can mean a myriad of athletic contexts. Uh, contests. We translate it as race because of the context. Um, and then he keeps saying, marked out for us. So again, this notion that the, the journey has been a journey that is tread upon by a countless group of people. And here comes the beautiful part, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross. And so the idea is, okay, Jesus has run the race. We have a litany of witnesses that have run the race. Let us make sure that we keep the goal in mind. Let me explain a little bit what the author is trying to say. For Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle, and Aristotle actually makes this clear, clear in his expose on ethics entitled the Nicomachean Ethics, a human being can withstand any amount of suffering or pain if the goal in mind is worthy. So, for Aristotle, the end always justifies the means. If the goal is worthy, you'll be able to journey the path of suffering, Aristotle would say. The author of Hebrews is borrowing from that construct in saying that Jesus viewed the goal as worthy and worth it to endure the suffering. And that should really, really stand out in your mind. Because in essence, what he is saying is, Jesus ran the race, endured the path of suffering because the goal in mind was worth it. A lot of times we try to guilt people into recognizing the wonder of the cross. But here the author of Hebrews is saying that you, as the ultimate goal, or what kept Jesus from feeling discouraged as he ran the race. And again, we go back to that idea that we shared a little bit in the beginning, right? There's this feedback loop. Not only does your faith help perfect the faith of those who have run before you, your journey helps give context and meaning to Christ's journey, just as Christ's journey helps to give context and meaning to your journey. How wondrous is that? How wondrous is it that the God who created it all looks at our paths and says, in the moment of his weakness, that journey is worth it. It gives meaning to my suffering. 
For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, transforming then this journey of sorrow into a celebration of success. And that's the paradox of Christianity. It's a paradox that the early Christian fathers and mothers understood well. It's this idea that Christianity is a paradox between running and resting, a paradox between success and suffering, a paradox between being justified and walking into in sanctification. It's a paradox that attempts to say and state that the life for the Christian is a crown of thorns. So what do we do? How are we sanctified? Because if really what the author of Hebrews is trying to push us towards is this idea that through this journey, the point is that your life began to replicate and mirror the life of Christ, not because you can do it on your own, but because you have allowed Christ and the witness of the church to complete you. How do I live my life? How do I engage in this path of faith development and character formation? Well, it's actually quite simple. Joey and I have the privilege of being pastors. And as Protestants, we believe in the priesthood of all believers. That is to say that every one of us is in some way or another a pastor. And the word pastor comes from the Latin, the same Latin root from which you get your uh, English word shepherd. So the point is this. The point is that sanctification is a shepherding journey. And what does a shepherd do? Well, a shepherd guides people through suffering and celebrates successes. Our job is to walk with one another through suffering because it is our companionship, it is our community, it is this cloud of witnesses that gives meaning to suffering, even as we hope for celebration and success. And it seems that as he begins to close this passage, that idea lingers in the air. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. And this idea of opposition is an idea that uh, denotes the, a notion of standing in contrast. And so it's not only that Jesus suffered physically, it is that rejection hurts. Rejection, loneliness, the path of suffering hurts. But the path of suffering provides meaning because we have a cloud of shepherds that walks with us through the shadow. And we have assurance in that cloud of shepherds because. Christ walked at first. That is why he is the pioneer and the perfecter. And so my invitation for you as you consider Christ as, and as you consider this inner journey of allowing Christ to dwell in you, even as you abide in him, may you be part, may you find a community that can shepherd you through shadow and celebrate with you in success. Joey, haven't seen you in a while. How are you doing? How was your week? It was good. It was a good week um, so far. And I um, missed you last week, although it was fun having that conversation with Philip. But uh, I, will, I just love these back and forths that we do. And I love how in this passage you you brought in the fact that these the, the author of Hebrews is taking the themes that you found find throughout the book of Hebrews of perseverance and and faith and sanctification and he's bringing it all together in this beautiful metaphor here and that was that was so powerful how you brought that all together 
Well, thank you, Joey. It's uh, it's it's a really complex passage, but it's complex if you just jump into the passage itself. That's, I think, why I love this book because it kind of builds upon yeah. itself. And what I what I just I'm so moved by, and and I think is it it's been throughout this quarter that I've begun to read it is I don't find a book that cries out more for faith development mm. and for character formation, what we in, in the Adventist church call sanctification, mm. more than this book. This mm. book says that the inner work that you do in allowing Christ to dwell in you, even as you dwell in Christ, really matters. It matters in a real sense. Uh, and so without... Without it negating the power of justification and the power uh, that allows us to celebrate that we are saved through and by Christ, it also invites us to consider the inner work that we have to do as we respond to what Jesus has done. So it's it's just a wonderful nuance that yeah. I think too often has been overlooked, not only by our church, but by the Christian church in general. Yeah, that we neglect sometimes the work that needs to be done in the inside that's foundational for anything that we do outside. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's so true. So with this passage, he he uses this metaphor of a race, which I, I love because, um, man, this idea of throwing off anything that it, mm -hmm. it hinders us because oftentimes when we think about, oh, what do I need to do to be saved? What we, our answer to that is, well, what minimum, or what we're really asking is, what minimum requirement do I need to achieve in order for Christ mm -hmm. to save us, right? Whereas that's not really what he's talking about here, right? He's talking about, it's like a race. Whatever you can shed, I, I, I know people that will, that will go to extreme lengths to shed a few ounces from their bike, you know, mm -hmm. if they're in a bike race. Or like you talked about, if they're in a um, race in water, then they're, they'll shave... They'll shave their the hair off their every part of their body. They'll wear a you know something to cover their hair on the top of the head, just so that they could just get microseconds of more speed, right? Mm -hmm. So it's saying whatever you can possibly cast off, cast it off if it's hindering you in this faith journey. And we don't often think about our faith journey that way, right? As a race where we just take everything off. We don't, and and I think we don't because as good Protestants we. We get concerned with, hey, if I start looking at what I have to do, then what 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 do we do with grace? Mm -hmm. So I think I think the nuance is important. Um, you don't you don't cast things off because you have an uncertainty of where the race ends mm. 26.1 miles if you're running a marathon is going to be 26.1 mile, miles 26.2 miles sorry um so that doesn't matter you know where the race starts when you know where the race ends and nothing that you get, that you can do is going to alter the starting point or the finishing point mm. for the race so you don't cast these things off in order for you to figure out where you're starting or or where it finishes we know where we're going to end up mm. Mm. you cast these things off because you want to run the race more efficiently you run you want to run the race more confidently you want you want to run the race more comfortably too mm. and so i think that this this idea of character formation which he's so big on in in this chapter is exactly that it's not hey where's the race going to end it's how do i run this race more efficiently with the god-given gift of time that i have on this world mm. and in order to do that you need to ask some really introspective questions mm. because you have to say what is hindering me what are these things that are not allowing me to be the the person that Christ has created me to be. Mm. And that's, that's sometimes a really scary question to ask, but I, I want us to make sure we understand that the nuance is, th that it's really nuanced. We're not casting these things off because we, we think we can have a different path uh, for the race, a different starting point or a different ending point. We're doing it because we know where the race ends and we're just trying to run more efficiently. Yeah. 
And if we think about it, we know that's true because we don't just follow Jesus because one day he's going to take us to heaven. Although that, you know, is the ultimate goal. We follow Jesus because we want to be better, right? We want to be better people. We want to be, I want to be a better father. I want to be a better friend. I want to be a better pastor. I want God to make me into the person that he always envisioned me to be when he, when he created me, mm-hmm. right? That's what I want. And so that journey requires for us to <clears throat> do that inner work mm-hmm. like you talked about. So what does that look like? What does that inner work look like to allow God, allow Jesus to be the, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith? Mm-hmm. What does that look like? That's a really good question. I think it, it starts it starts by and it starts I think with radical confession. Mm. Um, and we've talked about this a while uh, and, and several times. It's something that we don't do really well. Mm. Um, we I think have gotten really good at the art of portraying ourselves in, in the way that we want to be perceived. Mm. And we do that with each other. Mm. Um, and we do that because we feel like the relational dynamics between one another are going to break down if people really see me. Mm. Right? If you really see who I am, yeah. you're not going to like me anymore. And I want to be loved and I want to be accepted. And so we, we portray these images of ourselves. And, but the problem is that these things, because they're inauthentic, they're not organic to who we are, they hinder this process of character development, um, which demands authenticity. It demands vulnerability. When you're trying to form something, whether it's a better marriage or a better a relationship with your children, you need authenticity as, as kind of the starting point. And mm-hmm. so I think it starts with just radically confessing yourself and being mm-hmm. vulnerable to God. And this is, I think, where faith comes in. Mm-hmm. Because you have to step out in faith and say, God, you're going to see me at my worst. Mm -hmm. This is who I am at my darkest and at my worst when I don't want to run, when I'm tired and I'm frustrated and I'm angry. Mm -hmm. But I believe that because I was worth it, Mm -hmm. because Jesus saw me at my worst and said, she or he is worth it. Wow. I can be completely transparent and honest with you. Wow. Wow. So this journey begins, this inward healing journey begins with us having the courage to look at the brokenness and identify that brokenness and be honest about it. But that's really a scary thing mm-hmm. because because mm-hmm. most of our life is spent at hiding the brokenness and making sure that nobody else finds mm-hmm. it. Um, but because Jesus has shown that he loves us, he, and it's not like God doesn't know, right? God knows our brokenness and loves us and says we are valued, valuable to him anyway. We, we can have courage and enter into that. That's yeah. powerful. And there's, isn't there, there's something powerful about verbalizing that, Yeah. right? About just saying that. Um, I think we've lost. We've lost a lot of this capacity for dialogue Mm. with God. Um, The old uh, Christian fathers and mothers had this thing they called Lectio Divina, right? Mm. You would read scripture with the hope or in the hope of having a dialogue with God. Mm. So you would read and you you would listen. You would listen for God's response. Because what you were trying to do was you were trying to foster a dialogue with Mm. God. I don't think we do that that well anymore in the midst of of how busy our life is. Mm. We've lost the capacity to listen. And we've Mm. also lost the capacity to verbalize. And so I would invite us to begin to grab on to these really ancient ways of doing Christianity. These 2,000 years old ways of doing Christianity where where we actually verbalize. Mm. We say to God, God, I am struggling with my self-image because I can't accept myself Mm. Um, or whatever that brokenness is. God, Mm. I am struggling with anger because I feel forgotten or I don't feel you've seen me, whatever it is. Mm. 
verbalize that to God and then listen, listen for what God is saying. Because if we listen, God is a God who still speaks Mm. and you will feel the spirit moving and you will feel the spirit talking. And the beauty is, Joey, I think if we believe that the spirit is still active in our lives, we realize that that healing process that you're talking about isn't something that you or I are going to do. It's something that the spirit is going to do in me. Yeah. Um, but I can't listen to the prescription um, that the Spirit is attempting to give me because I'm constantly talking and distracted. Yeah, it's so true that constantly talking and distracted. I mean, that's the state of our lives right mm-hmm. now. I mean, we we are so uncomfortable not being distracted that whenever we're waiting in line, the first thing we do is what? We take out our phones, right? We're constantly trying to stimulate ourselves, trying to distract ourselves and not taking that time to really reflect on the brokenness inside. You know, I I remember um, someone saying that a lot of times the fights that we have are the same fights, but with different people. Mm -hmm. Because our brokenness, when it rubs up against somebody else, and we all have those people, we have certain types of people that really just trigger us, Mm -hmm. right? And when, when our brokenness rubs up against somebody else's, it just makes us react very Mm. strongly. So we have the same fights over and over and over again with lots of different people who all trigger us in the same way. And if we think about, I mean, even our relationship with our spouses, a lot of times we tend to have similar fights. It's about the same thing over and over again, but we don't actually take the time to think about what is at the root of that. What's causing me to have this fight over it? We don't examine it. We just try to get over that one issue and then move on without really healing the brokenness that's inside that's causing us to be triggered that, in that way, to, to, to react and re- respond in those ways. Yeah, that brokenness. And so you're saying that we need to take that time to create a space where we can actually examine that. Is that right? Yeah, no. And I think you've said it perfectly, right? That we do, we do have these issues that keep popping up time and time and time again. What I find funny is now this sounds new agey or like uh, mental health or personal growth stuff, which I mean, all of that is great, but this isn't new. Mm -hmm. I mean, we've been doing this as a church for 2000 years. Um, This idea of doing the inner work, that didn't start with with therapy. This this is the, the early church called it contemplatio. You would go inside and you would look inside and you would plead for the spirit to show you where that brokenness was. Yeah. Um, this idea of dialoguing and, and opening up your heart um, and, and sharing what you needed, oratio, mm-hmm. that would, that's what it was. It was to elevate as a, as, as a prayer of worship our needs and then to listen for mm-hmm. what God was doing. And then you talked a little bit about how busy we get, right? And mm-hmm. I was reading um, two things that really stuck out to me. There was a a little documentary made about, I think it was the 2010 LA Lakers who won uh, the NBA championship. And one of their players, Meta World Peace, also known as Ron Artest, uh, played a prominent role in that that particular journey. And uh, he had long, long, long and well-documented struggles with mental health. And so when he, when they won, he was one of the players interviewed and he actually credited his therapist Mm. uh, to teach him in the world in vogue now is mindfulness. How Mm. do I calm my, myself down? How do I open up a space in the middle of the busyness not to be unhurried? Mm. And so everybody was like, oh, that's great. Um, LeBron James, who, uh, who we all know is a, prominent sports figure invested in this app called Headspace, which also tries to teach you the same thing. And it's all over. It's it's huge. And people are connecting with this. Well, that's not new. Yeah. <laughs> that's this is this old path that that we have learned that we that we as Christians know what is Jesus doing as the crowds were pressing upon him you see time and time in the gospel said say and he retreated from from mm-hmm. from them so yeah he would have this heavy investment of relationships and then he would pull back in the early church called this meditation this mm-hmm. this moment where you 
try to silence mm. the busyness and quiet the hurry mm -hmm. in order to be fully in God's presence. All these things have happened before the, the pathways are set out. Mm -hmm. um, we just we just have forgotten them. And so I think it's great that through our study together, uh, both scripture and you and I are, are attempting to remind us to these old journeys. Um, and that's, I think, the power of the cloud of witnesses, that it connects you to this rich history that the church has. That's so true. I mean, and and throughout um, scripture, you're, you're told, so we cry out, search my heart, O God, make it ever true, right? So this idea of, of searching our hearts, this idea of contemplating and, and looking into our hearts and allowing God to make a transformation um, is, is, is found throughout scripture. And we're, you know, in, in Psalms, be still and be know still. that I am God, right? Again, this idea of stilling ourselves so that we can see God for who he really is. Mm -hmm. Because you're right, those voices out there are so loud that often we can't hear the Holy Spirit speaking to us and we don't take the time to examine the brokenness within mm -hmm. ourselves. And maybe maybe that's part of the, our strategy, right? To actually avoid examining ourselves by paying attention to all the other brokenness. It's our, our avoidance strategy to make ourselves feel good. We watch a video on Netflix or we, you know, we go on the news cycle or we watch a funny video on YouTube or, or something, something to distract us from the brokenness that's actually occurring inside of us. Mm -hmm. And then allowing the Holy Spirit to speak to us about that brokenness and how he wants to repair it. Yeah, and I think that's that's what I find most appealing about, we call it sanctification again, it's nothing new, it's something that the Eastern Church has been doing for a thousand years, they call it theosis, this idea of God lives inside you, mm -hmm. and you live inside God. Mm -hmm. And that has repercussions. I mean, just imagine if, you know, I have somebody, the the person that I love the most in my home, and there's a leak in the ceiling, and I don't, uh, it's the way it works. You're yeah. just going to get wet, I guess. <laughs> um, the, the idea of inner work is because this, this is God's house. Mm -hmm. And so just like I am called to live and abide in God, God, God is dwelling and living and breathing in, in me. And mm -hmm. so I think you tend to uh, the garden, as, as the early Christians would say, you tend to the garden mm -hmm. because God walks and frolics among the flowers. Wow, I love that imagery. <laughs> tend to the garden because God walks among the flowers. That's so beautiful. And again, this this can sound new agey, but that's not what this is. This no. Is, because in scripture, we're told that you are the temple of the Holy Spirit, right? I this is it. not, so we're not saying that, um, that, you know, when we, are, that we are the house of God, it's not something that's outside of scripture. And it's not definitely not saying that we are God, right? right? It's, this is not pantheism, no. right? This is, this is us saying that since God resides in us, that we are we are the temple of God. Our bodies are the temple of God. Then and our minds, and so we need we have. God wants to clean up. God wants to create, to fix, to make us all that He always intended us to be. Yeah, yeah, Joey, and I think thank you for bringing that up. That's another nuance um, that that I think keeps us on the orthodox side mm. of heresy. We're not pantheistic, but we are panentheistic. Mm. And that nuance is important to make. So we don't believe that all things are God, but we do believe that God is in all things. Mm. And so, and we have this idea, right? We have this idea throughout scripture. Uh, you are made in the image of God. You are created as a temple to God. Uh, Jesus, again, will tell his disciples that I want to I dwell inside you, that you mm -hmm. may dwell in me. And so we believe that God is in all things, even if we strongly would say, God, it, mm -hmm. all things are not God. And so that, I think, is a really important nuance that we, that we ought to note. Yeah. So what, what implication does that have for us? Um, we, we submit to this journey where we take off the weight and we allow God to, to transform us and to change us and to grow to us. Um, how does that, how does that connect with this paradox of suffering and celebration that you were talking mm. about? So does that mean that 
Is that process a process of suffering and celebration? Is that what you're saying? Yeah. I mean, think about it. When you start self-examining and you finally realize that all these issues that you're talking about mm. weren't other people's fault, yeah. but that you also hold responsibility. You have to hold a space in responsibility. Now, that can't be pleasant. Yeah. But I, 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 I know because I've, I've done this. I've actually mm. had to say, you know what? It was my bad. Yeah. I know that, yes, it might be uncomfortable. It might be painful in the moment, but it leads to so much more real and authentic and healthy relationships. And mm. so I think that's the paradox of celebration and suffering. Mm. Yes, recognizing coming to terms with that brokenness, like you call it inside us, is painful. Mm. But it leads to a more authentic and closely knitted relationship yeah. with God. You know, when you say that, it reminds me of Moses's journey, right? Because Moses had a 40 year journey in the wilderness where God was dealing with his brokenness, right? Mm. And he could have avoided all that if he just decided, I'm just gonna stay a prince in Egypt, mm -hmm. right? I, I, I'm gonna avoid the pain, I'm gonna avoid this suffering, I'm gonna avoid all of this heartache, and I'm just gonna live a pampered life in Egypt. And instead, that's not what he did. Mm. He he, he followed, and that's why he's commended in Hebrews 11, right? He followed with faith God. He made tragic mistakes because of his brokenness, but God still journeyed with him and eventually became, he became this, this leader, this, this leader of the Israelite community. This, and he didn't have an easy life. Mm -hmm. He had a really hard life. I, I, you know, sometimes I wonder if I were Moses and I knew where where that journey would take me to the wilderness and then you know suffering and leading the Israelites these 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 very terrible travel companions for for forty <laughs> years and then eventually to die without entering the promised land. If I knew all of that, would I choose that path rather than choosing the path of staying as a pampered prince in Egypt? I don't know. I mean, it is a much more difficult path. And yet that's the path we need to take if we're going to grow yeah. and change. Joey, that's a, it's a paradoxical path. As you were speaking, I thought about um, we, again, for 2,000 years, have had two ways of talking about the journey. Mm. Uh, via positiva, via negativa. I'm not going to do the Greek because y'all have had enough Greek for one day. <laughs> um, so the, the via positiva is where is God? Mm. So you try to find God in... in in Moses' case, yes, in the journey, think about the burning bush where mm. God is evident. Um, and so there's there's a lot, I think, of, of scriptural examples where you can actually feel and grasp where God is. And that's the celebration part of our faith experience. But the church has always believed that there's also another way, mm. another path that leads you to deeper knowledge of God. And that's the via negativa, mm. where God, where is God or where does God seem absent? Um, and that's the suffering piece. So to stay with the Moses motif, if the via positiva, if the where is um, would be the burning bush experience, the via negativa would be Moses going up Sinai and it's all covered in darkness and you mm. can't see God, but you're going to move by faith. Mm. And I think you need both of those realities. You mm. need the celebration and the light wow. and the joy, but you're also going to need the suffering and the darkness and the not knowing. And it is when, you, when you're able to, to know God through both of those experiences that you can say with absolute certainty, Christ is the pioneer and the perfecter of my faith. Wow, you know, that reminds me of that Martin Luther King Jr. quote, faith is taking the first step when you can't see the whole mm. staircase, right? Um, we do see enough that we can take that first step, mm -hmm. but we have no idea where the staircase will lead. And yet because of who God is and who it is that is calling us on this journey, because we trust him so much, we're willing to follow him up that staircase. Powerfully said. Joey, I've had fun. It's good to be back. Um, can you pray us out? Yes. Good and gracious God, we want to thank you, first of all, for having faith in us. Having faith in us enough to come down to this earth and to live and to die, not even knowing if any of us would choose to follow you. I mean, we didn't have a very good track record of following you. 
And yet you did that for us. So help us to have faith in you, someone who has an impeccable track record that we can trust you, even though you lead us through moments of suffering and celebration, that you will lead us to a good place, to a better place, to a place where we are whole and healed. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. So my dear friend, whether it be day or night, light or dark, spring or fall, Jesus remains pioneer and perfecter. God give you a happy Sabbath and we'll see you next week. Time now for Week in Review, and uh, before we get started, uh, here's Dr. Taylor uh, with this week's live Sabbath sponsors, Dr. Taylor. And we have Miss Esther and her family supporting the LLBN, the Wilson family from Maine, and then they go down into Maryland, the Lawrence family, and we cannot beat the folks in Colorado, the Wiggum family, supporting the live Sabbath broadcast. Wow, this is really, really a great thing, right? Oh, it's more than great. We yeah. just appreciate it here. Well, uh, you're a great thing, and I thank you for joining us for this edition of Week in Review. We have a special guest, uh, Pastor Carl Hafter. We're going to be talking to you about uh, the big uh, Christian Connections replay in a few minutes. Uh, also uh, joining us is... Uh... Hi, Sheila. Hey, Marlon. <laughs> <laughs> Sheila Hodgkins, and, uh, and uh, everybody knows Gannon. So time now for the verse of the day. Um, I think it's in uh, the chapter of Mark in the New Testament. That's right. Mark 1, 15. And it reads, the time has come. He said, the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. Hmm. Is that uh, sage advice to follow? Definitely. The good mm -hmm. news, what it's all about where God has conquered, and therefore, we are renewed. Mm. We can thank God for it. That's good news. Excellent. Well, what would you, why, why did you choose that first to share with us today? Well, first of all, because it it's, was the theme of this week about God's kingdom come. And uh, I learned something, mm. you know, I was reminded that, you know, we want God's kingdom to come, just like Jesus' prayer. You know, the Lord's Prayer when he said, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Mm -hmm. and Especially so, in these times. Absolutely. Yeah. And it was, it was a great conversation that people should watch on the replay. Mm. They won't want to miss it. Uh, what does this verse say to you, Pastor Carl Hafner? It says that um, no matter the chaos and craziness of the world, we can live in the presence of God. The kingdom of God is at hand in Christ, in his presence. Mm. Uh, the reality of the kingdom and, and God's kingdom comes breaking through uh, this dark world. So mm. it reminds me that there is peace and comfort and in the presence of God. Mm. Kenham has the last uh, word on the verse of the day. Kenham. Well, I mean, to Sheila's point, the her reading of the verse and, and, and everything I heard here, we have a choice to yeah. build God's kingdom here on earth or not. We are responsible for living in that kingdom here or be outside of the fence of that kingdom. So believers has to take control and decide, am I living God's way and according to his characters, or am I living according to the world? Yeah. And if we live according to his character, we have just built a healthy circle, uh, blessed by God and the Son and the Holy Spirit for us and for those who come around us. 
Well, this week's uh, Christian Connections, uh, where you can uh, see the replay uh, this afternoon, if you uh, missed it uh, this morning at 8 a.m. Pacific time. Uh, also, I think uh, through the weekend, you can uh, see uh, Pastor Carl as he delivers his message on uh, some uh, good news in, in, uh, in this bad times, the bad world. And uh, Tell us a little bit about, you know, the essence of what, what you're proposing. Yeah, it's uh, kind of juxtaposing the, the bad news that we are bombarded with uh, these days uh, with the message of Christ, which was consistent uh, in his teaching ministry. He just kept hammering on that same theme of the good news, you know, mm. the, the gospel. Uh, sometimes it's translated. And that good news is that now uh, the kingdom of God is accessible to all of us, uh, regardless of what's going on around yeah. us. Uh, we mm. can. Uh, live in the presence of Christ and experience a little bit of heaven on earth. Get him? Uh, I'm, I'm just eating the words here. I just love everything I'm here. And I, uh, everything is said here is true for the believers. They will understand it. If the non-believers, they would wonder what we're talking about. But for believers, we do know living in the presence of the Lord here is all we need on this earth because he will provide, he will guide, he will protect, mm -hmm. and he will be with us. Now, as we know, heaven's never going to be on this earth until after the second resurrection and, right. and the m millennium. But I like the way that you put it because dwelling in his temple, our bodies are, are his temple, yeah. uh, is as close as we're going to get to heaven uh, on this wicked earth. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so... But, Thank you for your message, by the way, and making uh, the time in your busy schedule Very welcome. to uh, help us out on, uh, with this on edition of Christian Connections. Now, next week, uh, LLBN is going to be the topic on Christian Connections. Uh, Ganem is here to give you just a flavor of what that's going to be like. Ganem? Well, Christian Connections next week, we're going to revisit what God, through His glory, had done here in this ministry at LLBN. I told the group here during the break we would be liars if we don't <laughs> testify that God, the mighty God of heaven, the creator of all things, had built this ministry from one block at a time to where we're at today and led to major growth. 70 million homes that we have reached to. That's a big number to reckon with. And part of that uh, is your help, your prayers, your financial support and given, and the expertise that theologians bring here to LLBN on a regular basis. So next Tuesday, you don't want to miss it. There's going to be a group discussion, revisiting past, present. Oh, cool. We'll talk about the future also. Hmm. <laughs> that sounds really exciting. Yes, uh, it may be better come back next week. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, another live program that we do here uh, besides uh, Christian Connections is uh, the Friday night worship live uh, with uh, Dan Smith and uh, Dr. Taylor has been involved in, in that ministry, that program uh, since its inception. So, so tell us a little bit about it. Friday Night Live, you don't want to miss it. Yes, sir. Ruben Escalante, Dan Smith, plain practical preaching mm. that really, as they say, scratches us where we itch and it helps us to live from day to day, mm. you see. You can't beat it. It's better than the other one that follows it on Saturday night. <laughs> <laughs> Don't miss it. Uh, it's uh, live at 6 p.m. Pacific time. Uh, you can go to the website and check uh, all the information about it. And uh, also, if you want to just uh, binge watch Pastor Dan, well, you can do that too uh, with the VOD that's available on that website. Speaking of the website, uh, LLBN is constantly in need of cash. And this week is no different. Uh, there's a lot of ways that you can support this ministry, and here's Sheila with uh, one of them. One of them is the Charitable Remainder Unit Trust, um, the document for highly appreciated property. Many of our viewers have highly appreciated properties such as stocks, securities, or real estate. The concern is, were they to sell these properties, they would have to pay capital gains. 
So taxes, and depending on what state you live in, it could be as much as 37%, and you don't want that. Enter the Charitable Remainder Trust. How it works, you transfer an appreciated asset into an irre irrevocable charitable trust, and you receive an immediate charitable income tax deduction. The trustee charity, LLBN, then sells the asset at full market value, paying no capital gains tax and reinvests the proceeds in income producing assets for a term of years or the rest of your life. The trust pays you an income. After your lifetime, the remaining trust assets go to bless the Lord's work at LLBN, leaving a legacy of support. Thus, it is called a charitable remainder trust. I want to encourage anyone that has questions about this or other plan giving services to contact LLBN for more information. And it's very, very important for folks to, to, to tap into these resources. We have Jay Hughes who oversees these projects, Marlon, but we have a, a, a group of attorneys, business people, finance organizations who are certified and set up just to do that for us. We don't do that here in LLB and we depend right. on our, the external entities <clears throat> that we have contracted with over the last 20 some years. Mm. Professionals uh, at your service, uh, just call Jay. He'll tell you all about it and put you in touch. Now, Yanam is going to uh, give us a quick update because the time is flying, uh, but he has all the time he needs to uh, talk about the new building. Well, I want to leave time for everyone else, so I'll tell you. You tune in next Tuesday to Christian Connections, and you can learn all about the building and how God being providing. But let me tell you, I am so excited. I am now seeing what I prayed to see 18 months ago. It is happening, it's right before our own eyes with pride and joy. I walked with Pastor Carl, yeah. Dr. Taylor and Sheila. Marlon I think was around behind us somewhere, but we walked in and we showed them the place and the big things yet to come out of this building. Glory to God, glory yeah. to what he has done and what you have done to support this ministry. So thank you from the bottom of our hearts. Tuesday, you'll learn more about it. Now, don't miss it. It's uh, really going to be a uh, eye opener uh, on how this whole thing came together. And you know, Marlon, some people think it takes a hundred thousand dollar gift to help us be on business. You know, they have to give big gifts. The mm -hmm. truth is, the five and the ten dollars and the hundred dollars and the two hundreds and the two fifty and the thousands all adds up together to we're able to nurture this ministry 26 years on the air, 24 seven on satellite, on internet, on all different platforms and able to build a building over using the same operation funds that comes in to support LLB. And if that isn't an act of God and an act of his faithful viewers, then I don't know what it is. Well, and, and I'm glad you mentioned that because it is true. We do not have any corporate uh, public or private sponsors at all, not one. Uh, we only have you. And as Gannon mentioned, your five and $10 donations uh, are what keeps this message going around the world. We've got nine foreign channels uh, that uh, support the thoughts and lifestyle of Jesus Christ. Uh, don't miss this opportunity to be a television missionary. Uh, call Jay Hughes and get the many ways that you can uh, support this ministry. Amen. Time now for your cards and letters, and Sheila's got a couple to share with you. Shirley from Raleigh, North Carolina wrote, I loved watching LLBN and making it a regular part of my day, telling people I meet about how to watch LLBN. May the Lord continue to bless you greatly. She's a witness, and she's a missionary. Mm-hmm. And William from Texa, Texarkana writes, Enclosed is a donation to say thank you for the beautiful music and spiritually nourishing programs you air. I'm blessed to have a part in LLBN's mission of lighting lives, blessing nations. Mm. Well, we want to thank Shirley and William. And Dr. Taylor, would you mind praying for Shirley and William? Shirley and Father, we thank you for the message. And we thank you for those who donate that this ministry might continue to belt the world. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Mm -hmm. Amen. 
Again, we want to thank uh, Pastor Carl Hafner for uh, joining us for this edition of Weekend Review, and also Dr. Taylor, and Sheila, and Ganim, and especially you. Uh, we wouldn't do this if you weren't watching. So we want to thank you for your support, and we wish the strongest blessings from God upon your family for peace and safety and release from fear. That's what we're all about here at the Loma Linda Broadcasting Network.
Thanks for watching our video. I hope you were blessed. Please subscribe and click that notification bell so you don't miss any of our new uploads. Never be sad or desponding, only have faith to believe. Grace for the duties before thee, ask of thy God and receive.
Once again, it's announcement time and we have a lot to talk about, so I'm gonna pass it over to Joelle right away. Thanks, Stu. If you are thinking about getting engaged or you're engaged, we have a seminar called Rules of Engagement just for you. You can go online to sign up. They will be meeting actually every Friday night in the month of April, starting April the 1st. There will be a light dinner at 6.30 and then the seminar will follow. And we just invite you and encourage you if you're thinking about this very important step in life to uh, join Rules of Engagement. Our next announcement is regarding a benefit concert to help support people in Ukraine. All of you are well aware of the conflict there and we're trying to do as much as we can to help our brothers and sisters, our people in Ukraine. So next week at 4 p.m. right in the, here in the sanctuary, the Loma Linda Academy, Music Department, the Loma Linda University Church Music Department, and UReach are partnering to do a benefit concert. It's gonna be some great music, but it's gonna support a wonderful cause. We encourage you to come out next week at 4 p.m. right here in the sanctuary. Also speaking of UReach, here's Linda Mendez, the director, to share more. Good morning, church family. I hope you're all having a wonderful Sabbath. This morning, I want to invite you to take a look at your church bulletin in it you will find a QR code like this one that will lead you to our UReach website. All you have to do is open your phone camera, point it to the QR code, and then click on the link and it will take you straight to our website where we will have a ministry update. We want to share all our ministries with you, the opportunities that there are to serve. We want to share ministry highlights, work opportunities, and other things that we have going on here at UReach. We currently have three positions opened at UReach. So if you're interested or want to find out more, or you just want to find out how you can serve, I encourage you to take the bulletin home and take a look at our QR code and visit our website. Or you can simply go to UReachLLUC.com and you can find us that way as well. We want to serve with you and we want to work together to further His kingdom. Thank you and God bless you. On March the 26th, we are going to have the Meloshenko family here at six o'clock in the sanctuary. Many of you know them as a family who has been singing for over five decades. They've been with the Voice of Prophecy, the Quiet Hour, and they're going to be here in our sanctuary. Again, that's March the 26th at six o'clock, and it's a free concert. And this concert will benefit gospel outreach. Well, we've been announcing it for a couple of weeks now. It's finally here. It's this evening at 7 p.m. The Improv program that's a joint venture between the Redlands Adventist Church, Crosswalk, and the Loma Linda University Church. It starts at 7 p.m. and it's at the auditorium in Redlands Adventist Church. It's gonna be a fun evening and we really encourage you to come check it out. Well, that's our announcements for today. As always, for more information, go to our website, louc.org or our app. And if you are visiting with us and our guests, we would really like to meet you. We have a great crew out at the Uconnect Center in the foyer. Come by, say hi, ask any questions that you might have. For the rest of you here in the sanctuary and joining us from home or wherever you're at, we love you guys and hope that you have a blessed Sabbath day.
Good morning. Oh, that was pretty weak. Let's try that again. Good morning. Good morning. Oh, that sounds better. I'm glad to hear you uh, respond so positively. And uh, we have a cipher in the organ. But uh, Kima knows how to take care of that. But we want to welcome each of you who are here with us in the congregation, and especially those who are uh, viewing from afar, wherever you are. We're glad you're here. And I want to give a special welcome to the Campania Ringers. I want to say singers, but they're the Ringers. Campania Ringers. And at Loma Linda University Church, our focus is on growing disciples for Christ's kingdom. And we have a number of ways of doing that. And if you look in our bulletin, you'll see a, a number listed there, but there are more on our website. But for instance, in, a, in today's bulletin, we have the prayer line that is going every morning. We, at 7 a.m., they pray for 45 minutes. And we, um, if you, you don't have to pray out loud, you can be a silent partner. And so that's one option. The second option is there's a women's prayer line, prayer meeting on Monday night. And there is a Zoom Bible study during the week on Thursday. And so there are lots of options that you have of how we grow disciples for Christ's kingdom. But the psalmist says, O come, let us Sing to the Lord. Let us shout joyfully to the rock of our salvation. And so I say again, welcome to worship here at Loma Linda University Church. Oh, 
you who are able, we invite you to kneel for prayer. Father God, it is so good to be here today. We are so grateful for life, for health, for all the blessings we receive from you. We are so grateful that we can worship you because when we worship you, we declare you, the Lord of Lords, the King of Kings, the one who has already won the victory, the one that rules, the one that is in the throne, the one that has written the last page. And the last page is a good one because we will be home with you. But right now, you know that we are struggling with so many things in so many areas. And we especially remember our brothers and sisters in Ukraine. But God, help us, teach us to have peace in the midst of whatever we are struggling with. Thank you for the opportunity to be here to worship together. Help us to be a community of love, peace, reconciliation. And as we learn from you, as we follow you, God, help us to remember that you are the only one who deserves our praise and worship. In the precious name of your beloved son, Jesus, we pray today. Amen. Sabbath blessings to everyone this beautiful Sabbath morning here at the Loma Linda University Church. This is the time where we talk about offering. Now, we're here to worship, right? We're here to worship in song. We're here to worship in prayer. We're here to worship through the spoken word that we receive. We're also here to worship through our giving. And this morning, I want to remind you that all that we give, we do it undergarded by the sense of gratitude. It's a sense of gratitude to God for who he is. If I asked you what kind of a week you had, maybe some of you had a wonderful week, we welcome a baby in your family, or someone that was sick was, you know, healed. Some others of you maybe had a very difficult week. And we see the images of things far away in our brothers in our country of, in the country of Ukraine and our hearts break. We look at ourselves here today and we say, how can we still be thankful? And we can. When Jesus went back to the Father, he said, I ask the Father to give you the Spirit. So we can be thankful today for the gift of the Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen. The Holy Spirit not only comforts us, guides us, and leads us, but one of my favorite passages just reminds me that the Holy Spirit reminds me who God is and reminds me who I am to God, who we are, who you are, a beloved child of God. The other thing that we can be thankful for together today is for community, for this community, this church here, and the church around the world. Why? Because here we gather together, we worship together, we support each other, and then we also have an opportunity to serve, to be the hands and feet of Jesus. So this morning, I invite you to express your gratitude to God through your giving. Thank you. 
more than two million Ukrainians currently find themselves without a home, are being forced to flee and find refuge in neighboring countries. Elderly, women with their children, people with disabilities, all waiting countless hours trying to cross the border in hopes of finding food, warmth, refuge, in hopes of finding safety. The following video we will show this morning will give you a glimpse of what our brothers and sisters in Ukraine are going through at the moment. If you, play, if you pay close attention, you can hear the cries of babies in the background. Mothers, people trying to make their way across to find comfort. This morning, I want to invite you to join me in supporting ADRA. The situation in Ukraine is not getting any better. It's getting worse which means that more people will be forced to leave their homes. ADRA needs our help. With our help, we, from here, from the comfort of our church, of our homes, we can make a difference for the people of Ukraine. So this morning, I want to invite you, take out your phones. It's okay, we won't judge you, just for today. Go to lluc.org and give. It will make a big difference. Next Sabbath, we are also having a benefit concert here at our church at 4 p.m. We want to encourage you to come and to join us so that we can also, at that concert, provide support for our brothers and sisters in Ukraine. And while your financial support is greatly appreciated and needed, our brothers and sisters in Ukraine also need our prayers. And this morning, I want to invite Pastor Anita Roberts up here to provide a prayer for our brothers and sisters, a prayer for protection, a prayer of blessing, not just for the people of Ukraine, but also for the people that are helping in Ukraine. We want to ask that God gives them peace, that God gives them protection, and that through this, they can be blessed. Let us bow our heads in prayer this morning. Oh, gracious Father, words are really inadequate to describe our emotions as we see the images of the devastation in Ukraine, Lord. The desperation, the cries of babies and moms and children, Lord. Our hearts are broken, and we know your heart is broken, Lord. This morning, Lord, as we I see the pain and the suffering, the horrific effects of war, Lord. We, we cry out to you on behalf of the people of Ukraine, Lord. Lord, it is our desire that you would bring peace, resolution. But Lord, we need to know how to respond. And we pray that you would grant us the wisdom to know how to respond and the courage to do it, Lord, to support financially, to support in prayer, to whatever ways that you touch our hearts, Lord, today. But most of all, Lord, break our hearts because your heart is broken, Lord, and we desire for this to have a resolution and an end. We know, Lord, that um, as people suffer, and cry, Lord, that your heart breaks. So, Father, this morning, we pray for your hand to be upon them. And we pray also for all the people that are trying to help, for the countries that are taking all those millions of refugees, for the medical workers, for the uh, people that are going there right now, even people from here from Loma Linda that have already left or are leaving in the next few days, Lord to bring help, to bring aid, Lord. May your spirit go before them. 
We pray, Lord, for healing. We pray for your coming soon, Lord, to bring end to all this sorrow and pain. And we're thankful that you hear our prayers, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Happy Sabbath, boys and girls. I have a question for you. Now, I know you're looking at me saying, he's dressed a little funny today, and there's no choir, so what's he doing up there? So my question is, what do you think, or who do you think I might be dressed as today? Go ahead and just shout it out. I know we're in church, but you could do it today. What do you think I am dressed as today? Go ahead. Oh, all kinds of things. I did hear judge, which is true. I am dressed as a judge. I, I, earlier this morning, somebody saw me and said, oh, it's graduation already. <laughs> Sorry to disappoint, but it's not graduation. I am dressed as a judge in kind of a boring black drudge, judge's gown. Now, these weren't always that bo boring. In fact, when judges first started wearing robes like this, about seven or 800 years ago, they were very colorful. In fact, in the winter, they would wear green gowns, and in the springtime or summer and even part of the fall when the weather was a bit warmer, they would wear, they would wear purple gowns. And then for very special occasions, they would put on red. Well, that changed over time, and eventually they, they started wearing black gowns in the winter with with fur lining and fur collars, and they were dressed up quite a bit. And then the rest of the time they would wear, if they wore their purple or their red, they would, they would spruce it up a little bit with, with puffy pink um, puffiness on the sleeves, which you could probably imagine, but not often see a judge wearing today. Well, why do judges wear these funny gowns, boys and girls? Why do you think, does this help them do their job dressed like this? Maybe it makes them look important or some, have some kind of significance. They, they also have other tools. I have some of them here in my, in my fruit basket. They have these, these funny hammers that they call a gavel. Now, you can, you can hit your desk with it, I suppose. It doesn't do very well at hammering a nail or anything useful, but they would use these. And then they had, they had something else here. I'll, let me pull it out of my, my fruit basket and show you. Now, let me, let me just see, see what this, this might look like. All right, there. Now I'm a judge. So a lot of judges would, would wear wigs, too, that are very hot and scratchy, and they would powder them, and somehow this helped them do their job, too, apparently. Now, when they moved to the United States, there was an argument. There was a, a man named John and a man named Tom, and John and Tom used to argue with each other about quite a few things, but one thing they argued about was what should judges in this country dress like? Now, John, who was a lawyer, said, we should dress just like the judges in England. We should wear gowns, which were green at that time, and we should wear the wigs. Tom said, we should wear neither. Well, they compromised and, and got rid of the, the wigs, thankfully. But they, they kept the gowns. Now, this gown doesn't do a whole lot. Right? I, I put it on, I take it off. Does it make me wiser? Am I able to do more things because I, I put on a gown? I, at least you can tell that I'm supposed to be a judge based on your response to my, my question, that I'm supposed to be a judge because I'm wearing a judge's gown. Well, let me let, me let you in on a little secret. Judges can order things. They can tell you what to do. Boys and girls, just like your parents tell you what to do, judges tell grown-ups what to do. But just like when your parents tell you to do something, you can do it because you're obedient, but it might not be what you're wanting to do yourself. For example, let's say you're arguing with your brother or your sister, and your parents say, stop being angry. 
Do you automatically stop being angry because your parents told you to? That's pretty hard to do. A judge can do some, something similar, can order you to do something. In fact, the judge's job is to look at people that have an argument. When grown-ups have arguments, sometimes they don't have a parent that can tell them what to do, so they have to go to the judge, and the judge will tell them, here's what we want you to do, and, or here's who wins. And the judge's job is to restore peace by ordering people to do certain things. But just because a judge says to somebody, I order you to have peace, that does not mean that person feels peace. And something occurred to me as I was thinking about how judges make these order, orders and tell people you have to get along now. There is a passage in the Bible I was reading the other day in John 14 where Jesus is about to leave and when he leaves, he says something. He says, peace I give you. Peace I leave with you. My peace, he says, I give to you. The gift of Jesus is peace. Now that's a different kind of peace than the world gives, a different kind of peace than a judge who puts on a robe and orders peace. It is a peace that that goes beyond all understanding, my Bible tells me. It's the peace of Jesus. Now, as I look at my, my fruit basket, I have apples and, and oranges, and I, I also have a pear. My pear today represents peace. It's easy to remember because it starts with P. So anytime you are going to eat a pear, I want you to just think about peace, but not the peace that a judge may require you to have, but the peace that is within all of us that Jesus gives us as his gift. So when you eat a piece of a pear, remember, Jesus gives us his peace. I'd like to invite Sage Joy to bring her parents up to the front. <laughs> Trent and Heather Robeson are bringing their little one, Sage, in dedication today. And I'm just delighted to be a part of this. Because it hasn't been that many years ago, come right on over here, it hadn't been that many years ago since the two of you stood facing the ocean that way. And I had the privilege of standing in front of you and officiating at your wedding. A beautiful occasion it was. How could we have known that day, Sage, that you would be here today? <laughs> now, you kind of changed things in the world because I don't know if you realize this. It didn't make all the news channels, but Sage was born two years ago in March and the world shut down. I mean, the world just kind of said, well, we can't do any better than that, so we're done. <laughs> Did you know that? That was a very momentous time when she came into the world, made her appearance. And she has blessed her daddy's and her mommy's lives in profound ways. It was a joy to me to watch you all talk about her and interact about her, just the sense of, of happiness that dwells within you at seeing her begin to grow up, begin to explore, to learn, to understand so much new. And then to think about this day. Now, the honest truth is they had thought about doing this, as many other parents did, back when Sage was a bit younger, and then this thing called COVID kind of impacted a lot of things. And so here we are just a little bit later in doing that, but just as meaningful and just as special. Now, I was asking Mom, Dad, Trent, and Heather about what are you learning from her, what's she teaching you, and so forth. Mom says, well, she's reintroduced me to morning. <laughs> I'm learning mornings are, are early. Uh, but they both say she's a wonderful combination of the two of us. She's very spontaneous like Dad, and yet also very detailed like Mom. She loves the water, and Dad's a, a man of the water, loves the water, doesn't want to get out of the water, and has just brought a great deal of joy into their lives. Trent and Heather come today here with friends and family members. So if you're somebody who's in love with little Sage and you want to support her dedication today, I want to ask you if you would stand and show your support for this dedication. Sage, look at that. All those people out there, 
All those people are waving at you. There you go. <laughs> waving at you and love you. Uh, even over here on the left, yeah. I'm looking to see if I'm missing any others. These are all your fans. They may not admit it, but they are. <laughs> Thank you so much for being here. You may be seated. As we talked about this act of dedication with mom and dad, we just reflected on the fact that this is an ancient act of bringing little ones to God in dedication. And that's why we bring Sage today. The mothers brought their little ones to Jesus, and the disciples said, no, 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 he's busy. He's got other things to do. And the RRV, which is the Randy Roberts version, <laughs> Jesus said, what are you talking about? This is who I came for. These are the ones that make up my kingdom, so bring them to me. And they brought them, and he blessed them. So, Sage, we're going to pray, and we're going to ask God to bless you. Actually, before we pray, I'm going to read something. This is what Mom and Dad wrote to our precious daughter, Sage. Today we are proud and excited to dedicate you to Jesus. But just as important, we are committing to raise you as a daughter of Christ. You're, that is so precious, Sage. <laughs> You are so special to mommy and daddy, and we are so very blessed that Jesus gave us you. We love seeing you pray to Jesus and how much you enjoy reading your Bible stories. We pray that you will always love Jesus and know how much he loves you too. May he bless you with happiness and peace to conquer the world. We love you so much and are so proud of you. And that's mommy and daddy, Sage. And one day you'll watch this video and you'll know just how meaningful this was to your parents. So we're going to pray together now. I'm going to invite you to pray. Now, we talked about whether or not she'd let me hold her. We can try. She's at that age of stranger danger. Do you want to come to me, Sage? She says, no. I... <laughs> Thank you very much. Just keep your hands off of me. <laughs> All right. We'll pray while you're there with Mommy then. Can we pray to Jesus? Okay. Gracious God. A gift that is beyond words is being held by her mom at her dad's side. Lord, thank you for this gift of life. We pray that your spirit would be with Sage from this moment and this day to bless her all the days of her life. Be with her mom and dad. Give them wisdom as they help to guide her pathway with all those who stood, who are her extended family and friends, and with our church. We dedicate all to you that Sage might grow up to know and to love Jesus. And we thank you for that. And all of God's people said... Amen. Amen. God bless you, Sage. Thank you. A very warm, happy Sabbath to each one of you here and to those around the world that are joining us. My friend Margaret and I are very happy to share the scripture reading today. We will be reading from the book of Galatians, chapter 1, verses 1 to 5, and chapter 5, verses 14 to 18, from the New International Version. Paul, an apostle, sent not from men, nor by a man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead, and all the brothers and sisters with me to the churches in Galatia. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to rescue us from the present evil age, according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. May I never boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. Neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything. What counts is the new creation. Peace and mercy to all who follow this rule to the Israel of God. From now on, let no one cause me trouble, 
for I bear on my body the marks of Jesus. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit, brothers and sisters. Amen. Amen. God. Are you a person of peace? I read from Galatians 5, verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Are you a person of peace? I read about a seminar director who asked the seminar attendees to engage in an activity with him that I'm going to ask you to engage in with me. So would you humor me for a moment and close your eyes and in your mind, through your mind's eye, I'd like you to picture a place, a tangible, real, physical place in this world, picture a place that to you evokes peace. What place would you go to to find peace? Now, I hope you think about it because I'm going to ask some of you what place you've been to. So, you have that place pictured in your mind? All right, you can open your eyes. When you thought of peace, you thought of? The coast. The coast. Ah, beautiful. For those of us who live out here in California, that makes a lot of sense. When you thought of peace, you thought of? Same, the beach. Same, the <laughs> beach, all right. We have a little bit of a, of a theme going. When you thought of peace? The desert. The desert, all right. That's another one that makes sense. Back here, when you thought of peace? A hammock. A hammock. <laughs> all right, I can do that. One more right here. When you thought of peace? Right here at Loma Linda. Right here, oh mercy, all right. That's a good answer, I didn't even pay him for that. So the seminar leader asked his attendees, would you, would you think of a place? And when they answered as you did, there were similarities in their answers. They said the beach, the waves gently lapping at the white sand, the desert, the saguaro cactus, silent sentinels to the hawk lazily winging its way overhead, the meadow, the gentle breeze, the flowers. The seminar director then said, now I want you to notice something. While there are differences in all of the different places that you went to, there is one key similarity. And that key similarity is this. In order to get to that place, you got rid of all the people. <laughs> the people disappeared out of that image went to the beach, to the desert, to the mountains, and away from all these other people. That's peace. And I get that. That's the same thing I do. But we immediately recognize there's a problem in that. Because the reality is our lives are filled with people. Like it or not. Of all stripes and all varieties, you turn on the news and there you see people killing other people in the Ukraine. You walk into the office at work and down the hallway you see that colleague that causes you so much conflict. You drive home and there's the neighbor with whom you're fighting over the property line. You answer your phone and you wonder how did you get through a telemarketer and you spew a few choice words that you didn't say yet this morning at church. And you think, people, give me the desert, give me the mountain, give me the beach, give me peace and take all these people with you because I need to have peace. But the problem is people are part of our lives. So I want to ask you the question again. Are you a person of peace? Remember what Paul says here. He says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance or patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control, peace. The Greek word is irene. Uh, of, of the different sources I consulted, I thought the best one was William Barclay to describe the meaning 
of that word. Here's how he puts it. Usually in the New Testament, Irene stands for the Hebrew shalom and means not just freedom from trouble, but everything that makes for a person's highest good. Here it means that tranquility of heart which derives from the all-pervading consciousness that our times are in the hands of God. Now, Barclay is right to join together the Greek word irene and the Hebrew word shalom, although I'm guessing that many of you here know the word shalom much more quickly than you do the Greek term. And yet they are definitely related. When millennia ago they sat down to translate the Hebrew scriptures into the, he into the Greek language, which became the Septuagint, 250 times they rendered the Hebrew term shalom as the Greek term irene. So they're related. That word shalom has many nuances of meaning. It means not only absence of conflict and maybe quiet or peacefulness. It means things like wholeness and completeness and generosity, the good life. It's a very robust word. And Paul says, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace. So let me ask you. Are you a person of peace? Would that describe you? I think that in order to answer that question, we have to look at least at three pictures in your life and mind. A very big picture, a smaller picture, and the smallest picture of all. The big picture is our world. The smaller picture is our relationships. The smallest picture is our soul. So when you consider those three, are you a person of peace? Well, let's start with the biggest picture, the world. It doesn't take a kindergarten graduate to be able to affirm the fact that our globe, our planet, is riven by rage and shattered by conflict. Strife on every hand. The recent pictures that have come out of the Ukraine continue to be heartbreaking, and yet they are far from alone. In fact, Will and Ariel Durant, who wrote an 11-volume history of the world, said that in their studies, they covered, as they did this part of it, 3,421 years. That's a lot of time. 3,421 years, they said they were only able to find 268 years, and those were scattered all through the 3,421, only able to find 268 years where there was true peace on the planet, no wars going on. Less than 8% of the years they assessed. No wonder one person described peace as that blessed moment of quiet in history when everybody stands around reloading. <laughs> Just getting ready, because we know it's coming. That's the reality. Our globe is shattered by war. Yet we have often been insulated from it, isolated from it, and so we haven't felt we need to say too much about it, at least in the recent generations. It's been around the world, hasn't affected us as much. So I want to give you just a bit of a window. These are going to be quick hits. We're going to move through very quickly. Some realities about war. Some things we ought to consider. These are drawn from a piece in the New York Times and a piece in the Business Insider. So just notice this. How much does war cost? Vietnam, 500 billion. Korea, 336 billion. World War II, almost 3 trillion. Iraq, 2 trillion. What can war cost each person in the United States? Vietnam, $2,204. Korea, $2,266. World War II, 20388 Iraq, $8,000 per person. How dangerous is war for civilians? Between 1900 and 1990, 43 million soldiers died in wars. During the same period, 62 million civilians were killed. In the wars of the 1990s alone, civilian deaths constituted 75 to 90 percent of all war deaths. In other words, it's not just the military by any stretch. 
What is the civilian experience in war? They are shot, bombed, raped, starved, and driven from their homes. During World War II, 135,000 civilians died in two days in the firebombing in Dresden. A week later, in Forsheim, Germany, 17,800 people were killed in 22 minutes. In Russia, after the three-year Battle of Leningrad, only 600,000 civilians remained in a city that held a population of 2.5 million. One million were evacuated, 100,000 were conscripted into the Red Army, and 800,000 died. How does war affect children? More than two million children were killed in wars during the 1990s. Three times that number were disabled or seriously injured. And how many genocides have occurred since World War I? Dozens. The most devastating include those in the Soviet Union, where approximately 20 million were killed during Stalin's reign at Great Terror. Nazi Germany, where 6 million Jews were killed in concentration camps, along with 5 million or more gypsies, Jehovah's Witnesses, and other enemies of the German state. Cambodia, where 1.7 million of the country's 7 million were killed as a result of the actions of the Khmer Rouge, and Rwanda, where more than 1 million Tutsis and moderate Hutus were slaughtered over 10 weeks in 1994. It's mind-numbing. The numbers are too big to compute. No wonder. No wonder Stalin is reputed to have said, one death is a tragedy. A million deaths is a statistic. Because we look at it and it doesn't compute. It doesn't register. The ubiquity of war led to one person, a man named Don McLean, saying, we have all kinds of peace monuments in Washington, D.C. because we build one after every war. That's the biggest picture. Now, the temptation is to say, that has nothing to do with me. I can't do anything about that. I'm a church member in Southern California, and there's something true about that. But I did find something that got the wheels turned. I was nosing around on the Internet this week thinking about this theme of peace and came across a group, a movement really, that was called A Year Without War. It's a group of young adults and also some older adults who have come together and said, we can't just be silent. We can't just not say anything. We need to speak in some fashion. And so, <clears throat> pardon me, they started this movement. I want to read you the statement on their home page. Here's what it says. We are nonpartisan and nonreligious. We are neither anti-military nor a peace movement. We are a dedicated and engaged group of community activists with a simple clear mission to stop war for one whole year. We know that conflict between humans is inevitable. However, we know that war is an outdated and extremely violent means of conflict resolution, costing countless lives and resources. Living in peace is not simply the absence of war. However, the absence of war is the first essential step to living in peace. A year without war is humanity's first step to abolishing war. Our social experiment puts to use social media to give a stronger voice to a growing global community of ordinary people that just say no to war for one year. I don't know enough about this group to endorse them. I didn't have time to follow all the internet trails. But I was caught by two things. One thing that caught me was that this group of people said, we can't just sit idle. We have to do something. In our limited sphere, in our limited way, to make our voice heard, and to say, can we stop the madness just for a year? Just for a year, can we do that? That caught me. The second thing that caught me is the only thing that will end wars is the coming of Jesus. Because the human heart, with its evil, will not stop. But I must ask, isn't it fair to say that a group of disciples who follow a leader who is known as the Prince of Peace ought to say something? Because when you look at the life of Jesus, there are echoes of peace throughout his life. 
At his birth, the angelic chorus sang glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth, peace to those on whom his favor rests. At the time of his inaugural address, which we would come to know as the Sermon on the Mount, he stood up and he said, blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. On the night before his life ended, he huddled with his disciples in the upper room and he looked at them and he said, my peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. And then before the night was over, he had returned to the theme and said to them, in the world you will have trouble, but in me you will have peace. His first words in Luke's gospel when he appears to the gathered disciples after his resurrection are peace be to you. All through his life, there are echoes of peace. So if we say we are the ones who follow the Prince of Peace, maybe we ought to have some things to say about peace in the big picture. Are you a person of peace? There is the smaller picture. Not just your world, but your relationships. The people with whom you rub shoulders every day, the people who live near you or live with you, the people you work with, study with, play with, those people, the people in your lives with which we often struggle. I read a story about an elderly couple in a senior citizen's facility who fought all the time. Fought all the time. Morning till evening, they were fighting, sometimes screaming and yelling at each other. The staff had just about had it. Finally, the staff went in one day and said, that's enough. You cannot fight anymore or we're going to throw you out. They thought about that for a minute. And then the wife turned to her husband and said, Joe, I think we ought to pray. We ought to pray that one of us dies. (laughs) And then after the funeral, I'll go live with my sister. (laughs) Isn't it that way? It's like if we can just get these people out, if we go to the beach, to the mountain, to the desert, if we can just get there without the people, we'll be okay. We'll be at peace. Remember the Peanuts cartoon strip? In one strip, Lucy says to Charlie Brown, I hate everything. I hate the world. I hate the people. I hate everything. And Charlie Brown says to her, I I thought you said you had inner peace. She says, I do have inner peace. I just have outer obnoxiousness. <laughs> and it seems like that's what affects so many of our relationships between people. Marriages, homes, parents, children. A lack of peace. If there is anything that has augmented that, multiplied that, it's this thing called our devices. Social media. Technology. I really wrestled with whether or not to read what I've decided to read to you because I think it is one example of how that can affect us. Even this morning, manuscript written, outline done, notes prepared, I was still wrestling because it's graphic. It's tough to hear, but it's also pervasive. Written by Jeff Hooten, In a little journal called Citizen years ago, Hooten writes, Forgive me, for I have killed. I have used swords and shotguns, handguns and grenades. I have shot, stabbed, and bludgeoned. I have crushed skulls with golf clubs and hammers and baseball bats. I have slaughtered men and women, drug dealers and crime bosses, soldiers and secret agents, mad scientists and aliens, zombies, and the pizza guy. I've killed hundreds, even thousands, so many that I lost count long ago. I've taken up machine guns, plasma rifles, chainsaws. I have learned to aim for the head. I've killed with Xbox and GameCube, PlayStation and PC. I've killed with joystick, mouse and keyboard. I've killed for hours at a time on screens big and small, on laptops and high resolution monitors. I've killed in my basement, in my living room, at the local arcade at a neighbor's house with a co-worker's teenage son. I've killed late into the night until three or four in the morning because my adrenaline was surging, because the kids were safely in bed, because I was simply on a roll, because I was winning and they were dying. Every weeknight I play, most nights later than the one before. 
And every night I slink up the stairs and ease my weary frame into bed, trying not to disturb my wife who went to sleep hours before. My body is spent, yet I cannot sleep. The bedroom is silent, yet I can still hear those ominous refrains. I close my eyes, yet I can still see the pictures of endless corridors, each one leading to yet another door or outcropping, another blind corner, another enemy, another target. Come Saturday morning, I'm at the computer again. That's when I hear it. The muted thud of feet on the stairs. And there, standing to my right, eyes fixed on the screen, is my little boy. I tell him to go back upstairs, but he doesn't budge. In his mind, there's a cartoon on the computer, the likes of which he's never seen before. He somehow knows that this is forbidden fruit, that he, but, but yet he must possess its secrets, or at least observe them. I call for my wife, come and get your son. Later on, this boy, who has never operated a joystick in his life, asks me a question I never saw coming. Daddy, can I watch you play the bad game? Forgive me, for I have killed. Jeff Hooten wrote the words. The Apostle Paul wrote some words as well. The fruit of the Spirit is peace. It's just a game. And yet some who study such things says... It lights up the aggression centers in the brain and shuts down the centers of emotions like compassion in the brain. Are you a person of peace? It's not just something we put on at will. It's something that Paul says the Holy Spirit weaves into the fabric of of our lives grows toward mature fruit. That's the smaller picture. Are you a person of peace? What about the smallest picture? Your soul, my soul. Years ago, I was in a Bible study group and I asked the group, Give me a definition or at least something you think of when you hear the word peace. One person said, when I hear the word peace, I think of a hippie with long hair beads flashing the peace sign. And I thought, you've been around the block a couple times. Someone else said, when I think of peace, I think of nirvana. I said, okay, to each his own. Another said, when I think of peace, I think of harmony. All right. And the last one said, for me, peace is a little pill called Paxil. I said, well, actually that is true. And when well used, it can be a godsend. What is peace in the soul? I think that maybe the favorite text, and I base this just on pastoral observation over the years, maybe the favorite text for people facing hard times in their lives difficulties, circumstances that have them stirred up inside just may be a text that appears in Philippians 4, also from the pen of Paul. Man could write, you have to admit. Philippians 4. Do these words sound familiar? Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. I've spent a fair bit of time with this passage. And I think what Paul is saying in the first part of the passage, he's talking to us about the attitudinal choices that we can make. He's telling us to do things like be glad, to be gracious, to be grateful, 
to do this all in the presence of Jesus through the Spirit of God. Be glad, be gracious, be grateful. And then in the second part, he tells us what the result will be. And he does not tell us that your circumstances will change. He doesn't say that. There's no guarantee that you can base your peace on your circumstances, even the peace in your own heart. Instead, in the second part, he writes this line that for me for many years was a bit befuddling. He says, the peace of God that passes all understanding. Some versions render it, that transcends all understanding. What does that mean, Paul? I'll tell you what I think it means today. I think what Paul is saying is whatever circumstances you face, whatever is true in the biggest picture of your world, whatever is true in the smaller picture of your relationships, whatever is true in your own life, you can make choices to be glad, to be gracious, to be grateful. And when you do that, he says, you will have a peace that no one can explain. They just can't explain it. It makes no sense. They say, look at John. Look at all that John's facing. Look at what Mary is struggling with. And yet in the midst of all of that, they're at peace. I don't get it. That's what Paul is saying. What happens to you when people see your peace, they'll say, I don't understand that. How do you explain that? That transcends all human understanding. And yet it can be yours centered in the grace of God, by the kinds of choices we make when we face difficulty, to be glad, to be gracious, to be grateful. So I ask you, are you a person of peace? Is the Spirit of God working in your life in such a way that when you look at the biggest picture, you say, I don't know what I can do, but God, if you'll open doors, I'll just make my voice known for peace. In the smaller picture, I'll work for peace in the contexts where I live. I'll do what I can to promote a peaceful and harmonious environment. I love the realism of Paul. In Romans 12, he says to us, it, so far as possible, as much as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. He realizes it's not always possible, but so far as it's possible, as much as it depends on you, in other words, if it's not happening, don't let it be your fault. That smaller picture, and then the smallest picture. If you come before God, say, God, here's my life. I'm so grateful you're not angry with me like maybe I grew up thinking, but I can have peace with you, and I can be at peace in my soul. Are you a person of peace? Once upon a time, in a land far away, there was a king. A king who told his subjects there will be a contest. And the winner of the contest will enjoy riches beyond his or her imagination. Here's what we'll do. I want to award the person who paints the most beautiful depiction of peace with overwhelming wealth. Every artist and every would-be artist in the land grabbed a palette, a brush, and a canvas and began to slap paint onto the canvas, trying to win the prize. The day came. The great hall had all the paintings And the king, dressed in regal splendor, strode from one to the next, taking in each painting. People waited with bated breath. Who would win? It came down to two. The first was of a placid lake, nestled among the high mountains, snow-capped. The water of the lake crystal clear shining like a mirror, reflecting both the fluffy clouds in the sky and the mountains in the distance. The entire scene breathed tranquility, serenity, peace. But then there was that other one. The king stood before it for some time. If that first painting breathed peace, this breathed turmoil. 
It too was of a mountain lake scene. It too had mountains in the background, but this time the clouds were roiling and dark. You could almost hear the thunder, almost see the lightning, almost feel the ground shake beneath your feet with the raging wind. Great waterfall catapulted into the chasm, sending spray high into the air. It was a beautiful painting, but filled with turmoil. But as the king gazed at it, he noticed that just off to the side from the waterfall was a shrub that insistently clung to the face of the cliff. And within the branches of the shrub was a nest. And on the nest was a would-be mama bird sitting, quiet, peaceful. And the king had his winner. You can't control it all, but you can make a decision whether or not the Holy Spirit will have the privilege of growing fruit in your life. And Paul wrote, the fruit of the Spirit is peace. Gracious God, our world is ruptured, fractured, shattered. For some today, their personal lives are in ruins and chaos. And for others, there is turmoil in the soul, uncertainty about the future and uncertainty about you, God, to be honest. Would you somehow descend on us through your Spirit? Would you not just plant the tree, but grow the fruit in our lives that we might indeed and truly be people of peace? In Jesus' name, amen.
Time now for Week in Review, and uh, before we get started, uh, here's Dr. Taylor uh, with this week's live Sabbath sponsors. Dr. Taylor. And we have Miss Esther and her family supporting the LLBN, the Wilson family from Maine, and then they go down into Maryland, the Lawrence family, and we cannot beat the folks in Colorado, the Wigan family, supporting the live Sabbath broadcast. Wow, this is really, really a great thing, right? Oh, it's more than great. We yeah. just appreciate it here. Well, uh, you're a great thing, and I thank you for joining us for this edition of Week in Review. We have a special guest, uh, Pastor Carl Hafter. We're going to be talking to you about uh, the big uh, Christian Connections replay in a few minutes. Uh, also uh, joining us is... Uh, Hi, Sheila. Hey, Marlon. <laughs> <laughs> Sheila Hodgkins, and, uh, and uh, everybody knows Gannon. So time now for the verse of the day. Um, I think it's in uh, the chapter of Mark in the New Testament. That's right. Mark 1, 15. And it reads, the time has come. He said, the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. Hmm. Is that uh, sage advice to follow? Definitely. The good news what it's all about. For God has conquered, and therefore, we are renewed. Mm. We can thank God for it. That's good news. Excellent. Yeah. What would you, why, why did you choose that first to share with us today? Well, first of all, because it it's, was the theme of this week about God's kingdom come. And uh, I learned something, mm. you know, I was reminded that, you know, we want God's kingdom to come, just like Jesus' prayer you know, the Lord's Prayer when he said, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Mm -hmm. Especially so, in these times. Absolutely. Yeah. And mm -hmm. it, was, it was a great conversation that people should watch on the replay. Mm. They won't want to miss it. Uh, what does this verse say to you, Pastor Carl Hafner? It says that um, no matter the chaos and craziness of the world, we can live in the presence of God. The kingdom of God is at hand in Christ, in his presence. Mm. Uh, the reality of the kingdom and, and God's kingdom comes breaking through uh, this dark world. So mm. it reminds me that there is peace and comfort and in the presence of God. Mm. Kenham has the last uh, word on the verse of the day. Kenham. Well, I mean, to Sheila's point, the reading of the verse and, and, and everything I heard here, we have a choice to yeah. build God's kingdom here on earth or not. We are responsible for living in that kingdom here or be outside of the fence of that kingdom. So believers has to take control and decide, am I living God's way and according to his characters, or am I living according to the world? Yeah. And if we live according to his character, we have just built a healthy circle, uh, blessed by God and the Son and the Holy Spirit for us and for those who come around us. Well, this week's uh, Christian Connections, uh, where you can uh, see the replay uh, this afternoon, if you uh, missed it uh, this morning at 8 a.m., Pacific time. Uh, also, I think uh, through the weekend, you can uh, see uh, Pastor Carl as he delivers his message on uh, some uh, good news in, in, uh, in this bad times, the bad world. And uh, Tell us a little bit about, you know, the essence of what, what you're proposing. Yeah, it's uh, kind of juxtaposing the, the bad news that we are bombarded with uh, these days uh, with the message of Christ, which was consistent uh, in his teaching ministry. He just kept hammering on that same theme of the good news, you know, mm. the, the gospel. Uh, sometimes it's translated. And that good news is that now uh, the kingdom of God is accessible to all of us, uh, regardless of what's going on around yeah. us. Uh, we mm. can. Uh, live in the presence of Christ and experience a little bit of heaven on earth. Denim? Uh, I'm 
I'm just eating the words here. I just love everything I'm here, and I, um, everything is said here is true. For the believers, they will understand it. If the non-believers, they would wonder what we're talking about. But for believers, we do know living in the presence of the Lord here is all we need on this earth because he will provide, he will guide, he will protect, mm -hmm. and he will be with us. Now, as we know, heaven's never going to be on this earth until after the second resurrection and, right. and the m millennium. But I like the way that you put it because dwelling in his temple, our bodies are, are his temple, yeah. uh, is as close as we're going to get to heaven uh, on this wicked earth. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So but, thank you for your message, by the way, and making uh, the time in your busy schedule very welcome. to uh, help us out on, uh, with this on edition of Christian Connections. Now next week, uh, LLBN is going to be the topic on Christian Connections. Uh, Ganem is here to give you just a flavor of what that's going to be like. Ganem? Well, Christian Connections next week, we're going to revisit what God through His glory had done here in this ministry at LLBN. I told the group here during the break, we would be liars if we don't <laughs> testify that God, the mighty God of heaven, the creator of all things, had built this ministry from one block at a time to where we're at today and led to major growth. 70 million homes that we have reached to. That's a big number to reckon with. And part of that uh, is your help, your prayers, your financial support and given, and the expertise that theologians bring here to LLBN on a regular basis basis. So next Tuesday, you don't want to miss it. There's going to be a group discussion, revisiting past, present. Oh, cool. We'll talk about the future also. Hmm. <laughs> that sounds really exciting. Yes, uh, it may be better come back next week. Okay. <laughs> 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 well, um, another live program that we do here uh, besides uh, Christian Connections is uh, the Friday night worship live uh, with uh, Dan Smith and uh, Dr. Taylor has been involved in, in that ministry, that program, uh, since its inception. So tell us a little bit about it. Friday Night Live, you don't want to miss it. Yes, sir. Ruben Escalante, Dan Smith, plain practical preaching mm -hmm. that really, as they say, scratches us where we itch and it helps us to live from day to day, mm -hmm. you see. You can't beat it. It's better than the other one that follows it on Saturday night. <laughs> <laughs> Don't miss it. Uh, it's uh, live at 6 p.m. Pacific time. Uh, you can go to the website and check uh, all the information about it. And uh, also, if you want to just uh, binge watch Pastor Dan, well, you can do that too uh, with the VOD that's available on that website. Speaking of the website, uh, LLBN is constantly in need of cash, and this week is no different. Uh, there's a lot of ways that you can support this ministry, and here's Sheila with uh, one of them. One of them is the Charitable Remainder Unit Trust, um, the document for highly appreciated property. Many of our viewers have highly appreciated properties such as stock, securities, or real estate. The concern is, were they to sell these properties, they would have to pay capital gains. So taxes, and depending on what state you live in, it could be as much as 37%, and you don't want that. Enter the Charitable Remainder Trust. How it works, you transfer an appreciated asset into an irre irrevocable charitable trust, and you receive an immediate charitable income tax deduction. The trustee charity, LLBN, then sells the asset at full market value, paying no capital gains tax and reinvests the proceeds in income-producing assets for a term of years or the rest of your life. The trust pays you an income. After your lifetime, the remaining trust assets go to bless the Lord's work at LLBN, leaving a legacy of support. Thus, it is called a charitable remainder trust. I want to encourage anyone that has questions about this or other plan giving services to contact LLBN for more information. And it's very, very important for folks to, to, to tap into these resources. We have Jay Hughes who oversees these projects, Marlon, but we have a, a, a group of attorneys, business people, finance organizations who are certified 
and set up just to do that for us. We don't do that here in LLB and we depend right. on our and the external entities that we have contracted with over the last 20 some mm. years. Professionals uh, at your service, uh, just call Jay. He'll tell you all about it and put you in touch. Now, Yanam is going to uh, give us a quick update because the time is flying, uh, but he has all the time he needs to uh, talk about the new building. Well, I want to leave time for everyone else, so I'll tell you. You tune in next Tuesday to Christian Connections, and you can learn all about the building and how God being providing. But let me tell you, I am so excited. I am now seeing what I prayed to see 18 months ago. It is happening. It's right before our own eyes with pride and joy. I walked with Pastor Carl, yeah. and Dr. Taylor, and Sheila. Marlon, I think, was around behind us somewhere. But... We walked in and we showed them the place and the big things yet to come out of this building. Glory to God, glory yeah. to what he has done and what you have done to support this ministry. So thank you from the bottom of our hearts. Tuesday, you'll learn more about it. Yeah, don't miss it. It's uh, really going to be a uh, eye opener uh, on how this whole thing came together. And, you know, Marlon, some people think it takes a $100,000 gift to help us be on business. You know, they have to give big gifts. The mm -hmm. truth is the 5 and the $10 and the $100 and the 200s and the 250 and the thousands all adds up together to we're able to nurture this ministry 26 years on the air, 24-7, on satellite, on Internet, on all different platforms, and able to build a building over using the same operation funds that comes in to support LLB. And if that isn't an act of God and an act of his faithful viewers, then I don't know what it is. Well, and, and I'm glad you mentioned that because it is true. We do not have any corporate uh, public or private sponsors at all. Not one. Uh, we only have you. And as Gannon mentioned, your 5 and $10 donations uh, are what keeps this message going around the world. We've got nine foreign channels uh, that uh, support the thoughts and lifestyle of Jesus Christ. Uh, don't miss this opportunity to be a television miss missionary. Uh, call Jay Hughes and get the many ways that you can uh, support this ministry. Amen. Time now for your cards and letters, and Sheila's got a couple to share with you. Shirley from Raleigh, North Carolina wrote, I loved watching LLBN and making it a regular part of my day, telling people I meet about how to watch LLBN. May the Lord continue to bless you greatly. She's a witness and she's a missionary. Mm -hmm. And William from Texa, Texarkana writes, Enclosed is a donation to say thank you for the beautiful music and spiritually nourishing programs you air. I'm blessed to have a part and LLBN's mission of lighting lives, blessing nations. Mm. Well, we want to thank Shirley and William. And Dr. Taylor, would you mind praying for Shirley and William? Shirley and Father, we thank you for the message. And we thank you for those who donate that this ministry might continue to belt the world. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. Mm. Again, we want to thank uh, Pastor Carl Hafner for uh, joining us for this edition of Week in Review, and also Dr. Taylor, and Sheila, and Ganem, and especially you. Uh, we wouldn't do this if you weren't watching. So we want to thank you for your support, and we wish the strongest blessings from God upon your family for peace and safety and release from fear. That's what we're all about here at the Loma Linda Broadcasting Network.
to the heart of God, a place where we are Savior meet, near to the heart of God, oh Jesus blessed Redeemer, sent from the heart of God, oh To the heart of God.